take the sunflower seeds, please? Well, I'll save you a couple. They're oh, that yeah. Not on their own. <laughs> they're built into the granola. <laughs> How do I go back to that? There we go. Right, so. Living room, okay. So we're back on um, Second Corinthians. I'm going to endeavour to finish Second Corinthians tonight, God willing, because um, it's a little bit dry. So you know, bear with us. I'm I'm saying that for myself, but there might there's probably stuff within it which will be a great blessing to everybody and to certain people because um, you could be hearing things for the first time as well. There's certainly important information in there, um, but we'll press on through Second Corinthians because next is Romans, which is wonderful and it's absolutely packed with just treasure upon treasure. Um, I'm hoping we can fire through 2 Corinthians tonight and then look forward to Romans next week. So 2 Corinthians chapter 6, um, just as a reminder, we finished off 2 Corinthians chapter 5 last week. And where we finished on 5 was all about the ministry of reconciliation, that God was in Christ reconciling himself to the world. And we're commanded to be reconciled to God. And that's what our gospel is that we are to preach. Um, and that ended on, God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. So we're now on 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Thank you. As workers together with God, we ask you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time I have listened to you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Now is the acceptable time. Look, now is the day of salvation. So, yeah, it's just just saying there that um, don't don't waste don't waste this opportunity. Today is the day to be saved. Don't um, don't pass over the grace of God because now is the time to uh, to come to Him. We give no offence in anything that our service may not be blamed, but in all things we commend ourselves, which means they they proved themselves to be servants of God, and now He gives their qualities in which they demonstrated that they were servants of God in much patience in afflictions in necessities in distress in stripes so that means whippings beatings in imprisonments in tumults which are in riots basically because they were attacked there was riots many times when they were thrown out and attacked in labors in sleeplessness and in hunger so he's saying here that we prove up because this a lot of this context now is going into it. There's um, there's false teachers and false apostles arriving in Achaia in the Corinthian church, and have been um, called leading people away from the, from the teachings they've received from the apostles, basically, and causing problems and leading people to sin. And Paul is going to um, verify his ministry and show that. He is the one they should be listening to, essentially, and, and explains why. Um, and just telling them to not listen to these these false apostles, basically, and how to identify them. So, is that my watch there? Uh, I think yeah. so. Yeah. Nice one. So he's going into, he's starting to say here that the proofs, essentially, of his apostleship are suffering, basically. The life of Christ, of the true servant of God, in this case, is... Um, is the persecution he goes through. He says, I'm not doing this for, for gain. I'm not, you know, these guys are getting rich off of you. I'm serving you in in hunger and beatings and whippings and stonings and everything. He goes into that in detail in the coming chapters. So that's kind of the theme of these next few chapters to give context. So um, in riots, labours, sleeplessness and hunger. And then he talks about his, so that's what he's been through. And now this is his character by purity by knowledge, by patience, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, and by genuine love. These are things that he is proved how he 
proving himself to them as a true servant of God. By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armour of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. So these are all of the things he's demonstrating, being honest, genuinely loving. Miracles as well, showing the power of God. He's done miracles among them, healing and everything. And by righteousness, by honour and by dishonour, by evil report and good report. So some are saying evil things about him, some are saying good. As deceivers and yet true. So some are saying, you know, he's been lied about, but he stands for the truth. As unknown, so to some of them he's unknown, and yet well known. To some of them have met him in person and known well. This will be the third, when he goes back, it'll be the third time he goes to them. He's been to, the, to Corinth twice now. Um, so the first time, obviously, when he established it, and once after the first letter that we read a couple of weeks ago. As unknown and yet well known. As dying, and look, we live. So as though the appearance of dying and you know being punished and wasting away, but they are alive. As punished, but not killed. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. They make many rich through the gospel. As having nothing and yet possessing all things, because we are going to possess all things in the future. And we have every blessing in Christ and the poor will be rich and we will rule the world. O Corinthians, we have spoken frankly to you. Our heart is open wide. You are not restrained by us, but you are restrained in your own affections towards us. He's saying our hearts are wide open for you, but your hearts are somewhat closed towards us. In return, I speak to you as my children. You also be open. He's saying, please open your hearts to us as we have got my heart is open to you. Now this part now, verse 14, is talking about our life and conduct in the world. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion has light with darkness? What agreement has Christ with Belial, who is another name for, for the devil? Or what part has he who believes with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? <coughs> so this applies to many things. This can apply to our marriages. This can apply to how we spend our social time, our friend groups, and just how we choose to spend our time and our relationships, um, you know, the word is recommending that we, uh, well, the scriptures tell us that we have to interact with the world in, in some ways, otherwise you'd have to go out of the world, you know, we have to work and we have to trade and buy and sell and everything, but in terms of our lives, being yoked, being in relationships, being in marriages, being in, in friendships with unbelievers, um, it's saying, what fellowship are you going to have? What fellowship is a righteous person going to have with an unrighteous person? What fellowship is there with a the child of God and child of the devil? It's, it's not going to work. Um, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? Because you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live in them and I will walk in them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. The Lord wants us to be set apart and holy from, from the world, not be tangled up in worldly things with worldly people. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So remember the other scriptures where it says about dealing with the world as though we're not of the world, essentially. We have to be part of the world, but not in it. We still have to be able to interact with people, and but it's going to be from a an evangelical sense and and use wisdom of how we how much and how to what depth we interact with the world and unbelievers and the children of Satan um, and be careful about it and pray about it since we have these promises beloved let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God so to be holy is to be to be set apart. It's something for God's purpose and use, and it's something clean. So yeah, we have to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. That's all the deeds and works of the flesh, and 
yeah, and be perfectly holy, fearing God, that which is what causes us to depart from these things. And now this is Paul's joy at the church's repentance, which came from 1 Corinthians, the very strong admonitions that were given to the body there, and all the highlighting of what they were doing wrong, and his stark reminder that those who were doing these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That led many to repentance, and he was very, very pleased about that. Except us, we have wronged no one, we have corrupted no one, and we have defrauded no one. I do not say this to condemn you, for I have said before that you are in our hearts, so that we would die or live with you. Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my boasting of you. I am filled with comfort, and am exceedingly joyful in all our tribulations. So he's been, he's really pleased of what he's heard from the report that they repented from the first letter and he's very confident of them now. He's been boasting to his other workers in the gospel about, you know, these great holy people in Corinth who repented and are now really zealous for God. For when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest. We were troubled on every side. On the outside, there were conflicts. On the inside, there were fears. Nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us through the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming but also by the comfort with which he, he was comforted in you because he told us about your sincere desire, your mourning and your zeal towards me so that I rejoiced even more. So Titus came and said, hey, these guys have they've taken on board the letter. They've done what you said. They put out this guy, you know, led, led to repentance and it's all working well. They, they took it on and they're all, it's led to their mourning and their zeal. So they've mourned over the letter and they've wanted to prove themselves as we'll see in a minute, to, to redeem themselves and to um, uh, vindicate themselves from the accusations that they were tolerating all this sin and they were living in wickedness. Though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, he was regretted it at the time because he felt that it was going to make them all sad. Because I perceived that this same letter I had to write you, it caused you sorrow, though only for a while, because it was a very, as we know, very strongly worded letter and it was bringing them to grief. So telling us that obviously as we know from Hebrews um, chastisement from God no, no chastisement or correction is enjoyable while you're, while you're receiving it but just because somebody gets can get potentially very upset and not enjoy the truth and correction it doesn't mean that the person giving it is wrong if it, just because there's a, a negative response um, we are to speak the truth in love with gentleness and meekness but even then obviously Christ was the perfect personification of that he didn't ever do anything or say anything remotely wrong people still hated him and were very offended by his words wanted to throw him off cliffs stone him spat on him couldn't stand what he was saying because they hate the truth and Paul says similarly in the scriptures it says uh, do you hate me because I tell you the truth so sometimes even though we have to tell people hard truths um, they won't always receive it well and sometimes it will cause sorrow, but he says that it causes you sorrow only for a while, and it worked out in the end for good. Now I rejoice. I don't rejoice that you were made sorrowful, because you didn't want to make me sorrowful, but I rejoice that your sorrow led to repentance, because you were made sorrowful in a godly way, that you might not suffer loss in any way through us. Godly sorrow produces repentance that leads to salvation, and brings no regret. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing. You sorrowed in a godly way. Look what carefulness it produced in you. What vindication of yourself. So we, I know we looked at this on Sunday. But we can see now like the greater context of what this is about. We're talking about true repentance. This came from the response of the first letter. I would be saying well, that strong letter when I called out all your sins and I told you that the people doing this need to be kicked out of the church and it all led to this. It led to the carefulness, it led to godly sorrow, it led to repentance leading to salvation for the people who were not going towards salvation but they repented back to salvation. Vindicate, did they vindicate themselves? They wanted to prove that they were doing right. They were indignant over sin. They feared God. It led to intense desire uh, for God, zeal for righteousness. What avenging of wrong. They wanted to restore and avenge the things that have been done wrong. In all these things, you have proven yourselves to be innocent in this matter. So by doing all these things, they've shown to be innocent to the accusations of the first letter. 
So though I wrote to you, I did it not because of him who had done the wrong, nor because of him who had suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God would be evident for you. So saying that strongly worded letter, all that stuff they, they wrote, was so that they could actually see how much they're loved and cared about, and that would be seen in the sight of God. Therefore we were comforted in your comfort. <clears throat> so they were, he was comforted from the letter that report he'd received back from Titus. Yes, and we were exceedingly the more joyful for the sake of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. So I am not ashamed if I have boasted of anything to him regarding you. Basically saying like, it worked out well. I was bigging you up to Titus and he was pleased when he got there and I'm pleased with what I heard. So I'm not ashamed that I boasted about you guys because you, you did what I was uh, hoping you were going to do. But as we spoke all things to you in truth, even our boasting in the presence of Titus was found to be true. Now his affection abounds all the more towards you as he remembers the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling you received him. So Titus was really glad because they obeyed the letter. So he was pleased that he remembers the, their obedience to the scripture and that how with fear and trembling they received Titus as an apostle, as a man of God who came with this letter, rebuking them, and they, they heard it and obeyed it. And Titus was very happy about that. Therefore, I rejoice that I have confidence in you in everything. So Paul was really pleased now with their response to that. Um, and now the subject changes now and starts talking about um, encouraging the Corinthians to give generously um, to the needs from their riches because they're very wealthy there. Um, and look at the example of other churches. So moreover, brothers, we want you to experience the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. So he's saying, I'm now going to give you an example of how the grace of God has affected and led the church of Macedonia to what they do. How, in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty overflowed toward the riches of their generous giving. So the people in Macedonia were poor and they were going through really tough times, but because of their love and the, the effect the gospel has had on these people, they generously gave from, from what they could, even though they themselves didn't have a lot. And he's saying, look at these guys. This is a wonderful example, he's saying to these guys. It makes me think of um, when Christ talks about the, the generous widow who only had like okay. two pennies or something and gave like all she owned to the, to the temple. Um, and she, Christ said that she's given more than all of you because she had nothing, you know. It's a beautiful thing. Um, for I bear record that according to their means... And beyond their means, look. so according to their means and beyond their means, they freely gave, begging us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of ministering to the saints. So they really wanted to. So they're begging the apostles to take this gift to whoever it was for. But we have to keep in mind, this, with all of this, these, this giving is for the poor. Yeah, because these, a lot of this stuff, gets used as the ground for prosperity gospel preachers, evil people who twist this for their own riches because they love money. And it, in that case, they use it that it's all about sowing to them. Mm -hmm. Give me your money for blessings, which is wickedness because the scriptures are very clear and it's even in this. It is for the poor. <coughs> we have to, the, all of this commandments in the scriptures to give is to help those who are in need, poor people. Where um, does it say it's for It'll come up in a minute, yeah. So oh, right. there's often something that gets, they skip the little part about for the poor um, because they, they twist it to say, give it to the ministers, give it to the, give it to these churches, give it to these millionaire televangelists who've got helicopters and massive houses, <coughs> give them your money so that you'll be blessed. No, 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 no. That's a terrible, terrible crime. That, is, that way of thinking is condemned throughout the New Testament over and over and over again oh, yeah. about these people who love money, yeah. Um, so, I bear record that according to their means and beyond their means, they freely gave, begging us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of ministering to the saints. This they did, not as we expected. First, they gave themselves to the Lord, and then to us by the will of God. So, and it's just saying that basically they were saved, and then they 
wanted to minister because of what they received from God. So we urge Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this gracious deed for you, which is bringing the gift. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in utterance, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. So he's saying that you guys are well known to be um, abounding in faith, abounding in knowledge, abounding in love. I want to see you also abounding in the same way as the Macedonian church in generous giving. That This is what you're kind of lacking in, essentially. I want, you know, this is the example. These guys were really poor. They were really afflicted and persecuted, yet they're giving generously and really zealously. I want, I want you to do that as well. I say this not as a command, but to prove through the authenticity of others the sincerity also of your love. So I'm not commanding you to do this, but I want to show that by giving you this example of the Macedonians, I want to see your sincerity of your love of God and love for the church as well. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty you might be rich. So he forsook his godhood in heaven and everything in blessing and became, you know, became nothing and died as a criminal for us, forsook everything to and humbled himself so that we could become inheritors of his kingdom and all of his blessings and his riches. And in this matter, I give my advice. It is appropriate for you who began last year not only to give, but also to willingly give. So they gave last year, they took a collection. Now, therefore, complete the task so that as there was a willingness willingness to do so, there may also be a performance of it according to your means. Okay, so he's saying, basically, as there is a willingness to do it, do what you're willing to do. Basically, do it. Don't just talk about it. Perform and complete the task. Um, but notice it says according to your means, yeah, according to what you can afford to do. Don't bankrupt yourselves over this. Please give to the need of whoever, um, the poor and the and the churches that are suffering according to your means. So, I do not mean that other men have relief and you be burdened. So you're saying I'm not saying that you need to give everything so that you then yourselves are poor to help others. Essentially, I'm not I'm not putting this on, but equally, but for equality, look, that your abundance now at this time may supply their needs. That's what it's all about. Similar with in Acts, where it said they all sold everything so that everybody had everything in common and everyone it was evened out. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and that's what the kingdom of Christ will be. It will come. He will. Everything will be. It won't be this one percent have ninety nine percent of riches. It's going to be evened out. I do not mean that other men have relief and you be burdened, but for equality. So that your abundance now at this time, so they're currently, these guys are going through a time of, pro, of uh, prosperity. Your abundance now at this time might supply their need and that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be equality. As it is written, he who gathered, had, he who gathered much had no excess and he who gathered little had no lack. That's a reference back to Exodus when, um, oh, sorry, Jack. If you want to finish... I'm just saying it's a reference back to Exodus when the manna was given. Those Some people would gather loads and loads. Other people wouldn't be able to gather as much. But then they'd share it so everybody was... was, was uh, needs were met. Mm. Yeah. This part, this issue of equality is really interesting to me because mm. something on my mind to do with finance and about the rich and poor in the world today is that I, I was listening to a book that was talking about... It, the, the book is titled Rich Dad poor dad, mm -hmm. what the re rich teach their children that the poor people don't. Yeah. And it was had a great start and there was loads of stories and it was really, I learned a lot, it was an audio book, but then towards the end they started talking about taxes and how taxes punish people for being successful and, I, and that didn't sit right with me and I couldn't continue to listen to the book and this is, this fits with my feelings about that because essentially taxes are a kind of equal a egalitarian, balance. a balancing force, which is essentially godly, is Christian, is righteous, is holy. So I think this finally gives me the final, I'm no longer on the fence about this, I now can, I'm on a side that taxes are a, a good thing. Yeah. And a holy thing. Because they sort of, they're a mechanical enforcement to 
ensure that, in this country at least, the oppressed don't go completely without. That's why we've got a benefit system. Disabled people are able to get to get money from from the taxes of the rich, basically. Yeah. Like, because no um, one needs the excessive wealth. That's that that's the problem we've have. got with these massive with, corporations of getting out of paying their taxes, right. which would be billions. The Panama Papers. Which would papers. be billions back into the country, which, yeah. which would be able to support single parent families, disabled people, etc. And, and it would make things more equal. Um, there's some countries where there's no such system in place and people just, poor people, end up destitute and no able way to get out of it. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's not God's will. God's will is not... Amen. For the one percent to be have ninety nine percent the wealth, yeah, it's for no one to have need. Essentially, everything to be equally divided, and people help each other, and yeah. Amen. Yeah. So. Ah, yeah, that gives me a conclusion on that. As I was just thinking of people in the world trying to work out what the ideal right way for the world to work, and what a balance of wealth. It's God's plan. It's yeah. Yeah. And it's, yeah, you're, you're going to have people who... Down, people who fight against not, the taxes like, are satanic. Mm. Yeah, so that's why it's illegal. Yeah. Um, you're always going to have people in this world who you know, have, have, have worked harder and made better financial decisions and everything and have more, but yeah. it's there. It's God's will for them to be able to then help elevate people who are really poor. You know what I mean? So yeah. like... It's, a blessing so it's meeting them, the needs, isn't it? Yeah. They're more blessed to give them receive. Yeah. Well, it's just like a proof that God's plan is best to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We have to, our job is essentially to make our needs met to each other and then all contribute to helping each other as needed. I just think we have to think about how just we can help each other. As it is written, he who gathered much had no excess, and he who gathered little had no lack. But thanks be to God, who placed the same sincere care in the heart of Titus for you. For indeed, he accepted the exhortation, but being more zealous, he went to you of his own accord. So it's like, just saying there that we told him to do it, but he wanted to do it anyway, basically. And we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. So another guy went him, with him who was well known for, being, for evangelizing. And not only that, he was also chosen by the churches to travel with us with this gift, which we administer to the glory of the same Lord and to declare your with your mind. To prevent any man from blaming us in administering this abundant gift, providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. So it's basically saying that they sent them this gift and to give an oversight of it to show that this was being used appropriately so that not only we'd be doing it right in the sight of God but also we'd be seen to the sight of men to be managing this donation of these funds in an honest, transparent, godly way and I think that's very important as well um, with collection and church funds that there's a, there's a transparency in the community about how it's used and what it's used for and there shouldn't be any doubt or questions shouldn't be any secrecy or doubt and everyone should know make it plain to god and make it plain to everybody as well how it's been managed furthermore we have sent with them our brother whom we have frequently proved diligent in many things okay so there's another brother who again is saying is well attested and tested well attested in there. where is have a, just click that yeah Hello? Hello. Right. Back on. Thank you. We're just on verse 22. Okay. Yep. All right. Furthermore, we have sent with them our brother, whom we have through. One sec. There we go. Um, whom we have frequently proved diligent in many things. So they've sent a trustworthy brother along with Titus and along with this aforementioned guy as well. So it's three together with this gift, with this money. So they make sure that everything's being done above board um, and none of it's been misappropriated. 
but now is much more diligent due to the great confidence which he has in you. So this guy is much more passionate to come to the Corinthians now because he's heard about their good conduct and they're not just, you know, disobediently living. If anyone inquires about Titus, let them know he is my partner and my fellow helper concerning you. Or if our brothers are inquired about, they are messengers of the churches and they are the glory of Christ. Therefore, show to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. So he's saying, you know, we've been picking you guys up. Let them see that you are everything that we said you were. And if anyone wants to know who these people are, I testify for them. These are good, godly men in Jesus that have worked in the gospel for me. Um, so now the offering for the saints. Okay, so he's telling about how to give and how they should be doing it generously. And now he's talking about the offering for the saints. It is redundant for me to write to you concerning the ministry to the saints. I know your willingness, for which I boast of you to those in Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. So they were, I don't know if they've done it, but it sounds like they were ready to do a collection, or they did a collection a year ago, and that encouraged the Macedonians who we read about just now. Yet I have sent the brothers, lest our boasting about you might be in vain in this case, that as I said, you may be ready. Okay, so he's talking about, he wants them to be ready when Titus and these guys come to take their collection, they've laid up in store and they're, they're ready and they've got the money there, otherwise he's gonna be embarrassed and they'll both be embarrassed. At least if any Macedonians come along with me and we find you unprepared, we, not to mention you, should be ashamed of this confident boasting because we've been boasting about how generous they are and they're gonna help the needs and these guys are really, really generous and they're, they're good and they're following, you know, they're following Christ and giving. And they'll be embarrassed if this isn't the case. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brothers to go ahead to you and arrange beforehand your bountiful gift that you previously promised this year ago, that it might be prepared as a gift, not as a matter of greed. So he's going to go ahead, check, send someone ahead to check that they have collected the money and they're ready to help. Maybe it, not, it might be more than just money. It could be food and clothes and everything because there was a lot of um, persecution for the Christians as we were. If you remember watching the uh, Apostle Paul film, these guys were persecuted and outliers of society. So even basic needs of food and clothing was difficult because they were being kicked out of their workplaces, out of their homes and everything. So a very hard time for these people. Mm -hmm. um, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Okay, I know this to be very, very true. Um, I have to be... It's difficult to give teaching examples for something on, on this because we are also commanded to not let our left hand know what our right hand does and to not do our giving, do it in secret. But I can certainly encourage you that um, no matter how much we've sold and given and sort of given to... Um, uh, evangelistic missions or to like Israel and stuff like that God just gives the same amount and more back all the time um, happened very recently it's just, I can't get rid of it <laughs> it just comes back um, so you yeah God promises that you, God promises that you can trust him it can be scary but you know you say to you sell your goods give to the poor if you do it you sell something you don't need give it away and he'll just give it back to you. And so you, you'll always have what you need and he'll give you so you can give to more. Um, but yeah, don't listen to um, televangelists who love money and who are already rich and want to be more rich saying that you're meant to be giving it to them. So we should be giving it to those in need and to the poor specifically, to the needs of people, um, not to make rich people richer. So. And he talks about that in a second. So let every man give according to the purposes in his heart, not grudgingly and not out of necessity because God loves a cheerful giver. So it's not it's not like tithing. It's not the Old Testament thing where you have to give 10%. <clears throat> just give it, you know. It's you don't, It's not out of necessity. You don't have to. Do it according to the purpose of your heart, not grudgingly because God loves cheerful giving. So you do it to the need. You pray about it. You seek God, ask him, Lord, what do you want me to... Um, if you 
if you are able to, again, according to your means, if you've got something extra, or you come into something, a gift, or you realize that's something you don't need that you could sell and you could give to charity or a bit of money, you seek the Lord. What do you want me to do with this? Who is it for? Who's in need? You can wait as well. You know, if you're praying about that, God will always bring it to you. There'll be some, some need that'll come up. Someone will ask for something, you know, they need help. And you'll be able to. So um, God is able to make all grace abound towards you. Look, so this is the promise now. If we give in this way, God is able to make all grace abound towards you so that you always having enough of everything may abound to every good work. So that word abound means exceed in. Okay, have more than. Yeah, it's bigger. It's not just it's not just just make it. Abounding in something is leaping, is a lot. So God is able to make all grace, okay, abound. So all undeserved favour and blessing abound toward you, right? So that you always, so always, you always have enough of everything that you may abound to every good work. So it's not God's will will for us to be poor and not have um, our needs he wants us to have enough so we're able to when the need comes up of others we're able to bless them and help them so that we can praise god and they can praise god and it you know be wonderful as it is written this is the poor that he has dispersed abroad he has given to the poor and this is why he used this verse here to give context to it that's why he says as it is written in relation to what i've just written he has dispersed abroad and he has given to the poor not to the rich his righteousness remains forever. So it was about ministering to the needs of the poor so that everybody has equality and everybody has their needs met. And um, Yeah, that's similar scripture as well. Obviously it says, um, yeah, Andrew. It is uh, mainstream Christian doctrine, isn't it? Yeah, it comes from the Old Testament. Yeah, I don't know where they got they it. Stick to it. Yeah, they just kind of, they just brought it across. But, um, yeah. So it's wrong, really. Yeah, it's not. It's wrong doctrine that they're teaching. It is, yeah, yeah. And it's usually just for the for the ministers and for the church to pay the bills and pay the pastor mm. and you know keep the machine running and. Yeah, keep the machine running. Yeah, That's uh, why a lot of problems come from it because if, you, if you're in that situation, if you're in a, a financially dependent situation, dependent on your congregation, you can very easily get into a. Um, compromise situation where you want to keep people happy because you don't want them to leave and take their tithes with them because then oh what about my salary what about paying paying for this big grand church building with all its needs and everything do you know what i mean yes. um it's yeah it's it's dangerous and it's it's wrong when you read about everything in the scriptures how paul was always saying that i was never chargeable to you i i worked hard and paid my way because i didn't want to be chargeable to you because i didn't want to allow anything to get in the way of the gospel, do you know what I mean? Whereas if I was dependent on you guys, um, I have to seek a sense, you know, be seeker sensitive and keep people pleased and preach a nice message to tickle their ears and keep them keep them coming every week and give them their tithe because, yeah. That's why we haven't done a tithe for our little gathering because it's supposed to be where there's a need. There's no need, no, there's no need at the moment, do you know what I mean? So... What would you be calling it for? Do you know what I mean? Mm. The Old Testament form, as people say. No, it was a it was a temple system. It was like mandatory giving, but it was for the Levitical service. So the Levites were full timely doing. And they um, didn't get any inheritance. Sac- yeah, the they land. didn't get any inheritance. They had to just basically all the time sacrificing animals, praying to God, but doing the burnt offerings, doing the peace offerings, keeping the incense going, and that. And they were the first. Every firstborn was given to the temple. Right. Um, so. Everybody else who was able to work and make money and do all this stuff, mm. they gave 10% of what they get to God to, to, for the service of the ministry. Because these guys couldn't work normal jobs. They had no. to just give their time to God. Yes. When Israel was like divided, um, the nation was divided amongst the 12 tribes. Levites didn't, they get, didn't get anything. They didn't no, get they anything were just, because God priests, was their inheritance. Yeah, God was their inheritance. But like now, that. it's Which I from the scriptures, the church, it was that. just house churches. Yeah, so no people just live there anyway, so there's no rent to pay. And the people were working. They were like paying their own way, and they're commanded to work and pay their own way. Um, and Paul gave the example. He worked and paid his own way, even though he was a full-time apostle and minister. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's a funny old system that we've 
that the church has kind of come up with in that regard. Um, but we've got to go by the word, see what see what's said, and yeah. But in today's climate, ten percent can be very difficult for people. Yeah, some people are living. So say, a lot yeah, say you earn one thousand five hundred pounds a month. Your rent's nine hundred pounds. Yeah, to yeah. give one hundred and fifty quid, it's a lot of money. The government takes you know it. takes a big slice of that. Then you've got your council tax, your national insurance, and then yeah. you've got your energy bills and all these things. And yeah. yeah. But you said also that we live in a Kish Chris so Mark said this to me a while back as well. Like we have to, it's not we should give more than that though. I don't want to say this to make people think, oh well, I'm already giving. But the UK being a country based on Christian ethos and the laws based on Christian ethos, you know, us giving our taxes is is like a tithe to the nation, like to because it helps the needy, it helps the poor, it helps the NHS. That's what Jack know. was talking about yeah, earlier. I just mentioned this. Yeah, yeah. That, we've got a lot of good systems in place in that regard already. And the Christian um, systems, that yeah, based but, on Christian law yeah. and yeah, but that doesn't. But people take for granted. So many people say they're atheists, but they're not. They just enjoy so. They just enjoy it all, and then just disregard. You you wait until Romans chapter one. It's yeah. all about that. I'm looking forward to that next Atheists week. Atheists stand on the shoulders of Christians. That's exactly what chapter one. Another thing as well is Sorry. Arabs. Like Mark and I, we talked about this quite a lot before. So many Arabs come to the UK for a better life. Because in their countries, Sharia law is a really, really difficult, strict life. And you want to say to them, well, why do you think it's a better life here? Because it's a Christian law country. Like, we're based on Christian, like, foundations. Our law is based on a, on a Christian law. Like, well, we've closed our doors but then they want to come and then create Sharia law here. And it's like, you don't understand. You're bringing your problems mm. over. Yeah. <laughs> you just take things for granted for me. You left where you were because you didn't like it, and now you want to bring that here, and then you yeah. won't like it here. Because <laughs> it would be like home. <laughs> anyway, we're going digressing. So, um, now he who supplies seed to the sower and supplies bread for your food, that's God, he's talking about there, will also multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Praise God, that is very, very true. I was looking just now before you came, Hannah, that... Um, uh, just verse 8 that God is able um, to make all grace abound towards you so that you always have enough of everything and you're able to balance every good work mm -hmm. just saying that the more we give God just always gives it straight back yeah um, always every single time yeah it's wonderful but, um, he promises to and we don't have to worry about that So the amplified version of that verse as well the amplified translation Ampl yeah adds a lot to that um like adds more meat to that, doesn't it? Um, which is like, you know, in your own time, have a look at it. Yeah. It kind of really explains it. But please do not feel the need to give to me. Yeah. <laughs> That's the, indeed. I want to be clear to that. And yeah, don't, if you see any millionaire TV evangelist with a helicopter and 10 mansions saying yeah. to give to them, don't give to them. Yeah. <laughs> Go and give to someone poor. We watched so, a video about Joyce Myers recently, and it was just shocking. Yeah, yeah. It was God. just really appalling uh, what her ministry was doing to the poor. Yeah. So now he who supplies seed to the sower and supplies bread for your food, he will also multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Very true. So you will be enriched in everything to all bountifulness. Wow. Look at that. You will be enriched in everything to all bountifulness which makes us give thanks to God. That's the point of it, is that we will all be praising God. The more we, we give generously, it will come back to us. Good measure, pressed down, will be poured into your lap. Remember what it said? I was sent in the scripture the other day. Given it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken, runneth over. It will be given into your lap. The more you give, the more God gives to you. So everybody's just praising God for your giving, for God's provision, for God's blessing back to you. It's beautiful. So, yeah. Um, in my experience, it doesn't always come back in money. It can come back in many different favours. True, yeah, I mean. You know, yes. like holidays or just special favour mm. or a trip paid for. Yeah. So it's not always coming back as money in the hand. Yeah. No, it's indeed, blessing. yeah. yeah it's blessing. Absolutely, yeah. 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 Like a new job or, you know, anything like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I've had, you know jobs and promotions and things like that as well. And free holidays, for example, we're all going to be enjoying soon, things like that, mm -hmm. down in 
the worth of that place is yes. two thousand eight hundred pounds a week for this place yes. we're going to. I'd never be able to afford that. Well, not never, but certainly not now, or not in any recent years, well. or not in any time soon. That. I'd never a week. Yeah, I'd never spend that. Not in a dream. Even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't spend that much on a, a week away. So. For the administration of this service, it not only supplies the need of the saints, but it is abundant also through many thanksgivings to God. So that's what saying. It's not just about the saints getting their needs met. It's about that everybody is able to abundantly praise God and give thanks to God for this, for this blessing of how it works. Um, meanwhile, meanwhile, <laughs> it makes me think of that part the voice control thing. Through the performance of this ministry, they glorify God for the profession of your faith in the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and with all others. So these guys that were getting blessed in this way, they're glorifying God because they are, their faith is being proven by their good works, like it says in James, um, because they're liberally sharing with them and with all others. And Everybody's that, having equality as well. Yeah. The, uh, the reverse of that would be that couple that kept money secretly, didn't they? And then they fell dead in the tent. Yeah, they were. Yeah, true. That'd be the opposite of that. Yeah, well, that wasn't so much. Thing is, with that, that's not really the message of that story with the nice and Sephira. It was that they lied to the Holy Ghost about it. Um, they were very generous. They gave a lot, but they, they were trying to make out they'd given it all to look good to everybody. Because probably because there were other people giving all. Mm. Like Peter said, he said it was yours while you had it. And it was yours after you sold it. Why did you have to lie? Just mm. say we're going to keep half, and here's half. Like um, Zacchaeus. The I think he was a tax collector or something. Jesus came to his house and he said, Look, Lord, you know, like forgive my sins. I have forgiven everyone's debts that they owed me. I've sold everything. I've given half of my wealth to others. And if, if I've um conned anybody basically, I'll pay them back seven times as much or something. And Jesus said, Well, you know, praise God, salvation's come to this house. He didn't give everything away mm. and didn't lie. He mm. said, I've given half of what I, he's still, this was a rich guy, he's still wealthy, but he's given, to give half of what you owe is very, very generous indeed. Um, so it's just the fact that yeah, they lied about it is why they were struck down. Lied to God. Uh, and in their prayer for you, they long for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. So of all of this that he gives, so we can give and that everyone can praise God and, everyone, and there's equality and this is the will. It's beautiful. And these guys who receive this are um, praying for them and they long to see these people. This is talking about Macedonians long to fellowship with the Achaeans, their brothers and sisters in Christ. Second Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to sip of water a moment. Paul defends his ministry. This is all about these super apostles. These false, these uh, big talkers who come in. Now, is this, impossible? this is Paul, yeah, writing all of this, yeah, and Romans, which we're looking at next. He wrote, wrote most of the... There's only one the, Paul, isn't there? Yeah. There's only one Paul. There is, yeah. Now I, Paul, who am lowly in presence among you, but bold towards you while absent, I appeal to you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. So he's saying that when he's with them, he's like Christ, meek and gentle, but he has to... Upon hearing what they were doing, he had to write very strongly worded letters. I beg you that when I am present, I might not have to be bold with you with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some. So he's saying, I'd rather come to you and be able to be gentle and meek among you and not have to rebuke you strongly, um, which he intends to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. He's talking about these false false apostles and false teachers here now. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, so they're not physical, fleshly, not bows and arrows and swords, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, that's the pulling down of fortresses, casting down imaginations, casting down arguments, casting down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So these are their weapons there, the gospel, the knowledge, the scriptures. And being ready to punish all disobedience once 
your guy's obedience is complete. So once these guys are in obedience, it's going to punish the uh, remainder. Do you look at things from the outward appearance? So they're judging by appearances. Do you look at things from the outward appearance? If any man trusts that he is Christ's, i.e. that he belongs to Christ, let him consider again that as he is Christ's, even so we also are Christ. We all belong to Christ. For even if I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord has given us for edification and not for your destruction, I would not be ashamed. Least I appear to frighten you by my letters. So he's saying that. Um, he's not making full use of the authority that he's been given in Christ because he doesn't want to terrify, he doesn't want to frighten the people by two strong letters. They say, for his letters, they say, his letters are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. So his speech isn't very elegant and he's not very powerful and weighty when he's speaking to us. He's being gentle and meek like Christ, but he's writing these very firm letters. Let such a person who says that consider this, that as we are in word by these letters, when we are absent, we will also be in deed when we are present. Yeah, so the strongly worded letters this that they receive, they're like, oh, when Paul was with us, he was very gentle and meek. And now he's writing this strong thing. He's saying, I'm going to come and rebuke you just as harshly as the first letter I've written <laughs> if, uh, when I get there for, to, these, to these particular people. For we dare not count or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, right? So he said, I'm not going to start a kind of, it's a bit of an interesting thing. So he's saying, I'm not going to. These are pride thing. Then. So these are the guys. These guys have bigged themselves up. Yeah, he's saying, I'm not going to. Yeah. And we are men of God. Well, they're false. Yeah, they're false apostles. They're saying that they're trying to set themselves up as apostles. Yeah. Um, and he goes on now to justify his ministry. He's saying, I'm not going to start bigging myself up in the way they do. They who measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another are not wise. So these guys are like inflating themselves by man's standards by comparing themselves to other people. And Paul other goes on, churches. yeah. And Paul goes on to justify himself by his works and by his appointment from God. But we will not boast beyond measure, but we will boast within the boundaries which God has appointed us, which reach even you. So he's saying that these guys. Um, these people are his fruits. They know that he was the one who preached the gospel to them. Because we are not overextending ourselves as though we did not reach you, since we have come to you preaching the gospel of Christ. So these people, when he's on about reach, is the reach of the gospel. He, these people are his fruits. He's the one who brought the gospel to them. Because we are not boasting of things beyond our measure in other men's labours. He's saying, you are our labour. We're the ones who brought this to you in the first place. But we have hope that when your faith is increased, our region shall be greatly enlarged by you to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast another man's compliments. So he's saying that, I hope that when you guys are built up in your faith and you're maturing in Christ, our region, so our influence is going to be enlarged by you guys. You're going to go out to preach the gospel in regions beyond. So these guys, they themselves are going to become ministers and evangelists and spread the gospel. Yeah, That's his hope for them and his wish for them. And that's our aim for all of us, is to raise up um, other Christs to go out and carry on and spread the gospel. Uh, to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you, and not to boast in another man's accomplishments, but let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not he who commends himself who is approved, but he whom the Lord commends. Mm -hmm. Okay, So Lonely. these guys are commending themselves and bigging themselves up to each other and saying this and that, comparing themselves. And he's saying... That doesn't count for Toffee. The one who Jesus appoints and commends and who does God's will is the one that who is commended. So now look, Paul and the false apostles. He talks about them now and says what they've been doing, teaching. I wish to God that you, can you bear with me a little bit in my folly now? Indeed, bear with me. So he's going to be kind of talk foolishly now to make a point, be sarcastic in a way. For I am jealous over, over you with godly jealousy. I have espoused to you one husband. So he's married them to one husband, that is Christ, so that I can present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Right, so he's fathered these people in the gospel to present them to Christ. But I fear 
So he's not started the foolishness yet. I'll tell you when it starts. It's just it's leading up to it. Like, this no isn't foolishness. <laughs> no, no, no. You'll see when it starts. But his fear is, he's worried about these false apostles now, what they've been teaching. I fear that somehow, in the same way that Satan, the serpent, deceived Eve through his subtlety, through his trickery, I fear that your minds might be led astray from the simplicity that is in Christ. I love that sentence. And that simplicity was what we were looking at in the mini study the other day, that those who claim to love to love God is to keep his commandments. To love Christ is to keep the commandments. And to love the brothers and sisters means to keep God's commandments. Simple as that. Those who don't, who break the commandments, yet claim they love Jesus, but are wickedly sinning against him with big, big stuff, you know, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, this thing. They're liars. They don't love God and they don't love Christ. That's the simplicity of it all. And to love one another. And to love one another means keeping the commandments. It's as simple as that. Um, for if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or hear another gospel which you have not accepted, I fear you might submit to it readily enough. That's his worry. That's what's happening with these other these false apostles. For I think I am not in any way inferior to these most eminent of the apostles. Even though I am unpolished in speech, yet I am not in knowledge. Okay, so he's saying I'm not a, you know, a slick Elephant. talker like these guys with their deceptive, wonderful talking. Um, I'm not unpolished, though, in knowledge of God, of the scriptures, of Christ. All things about us have been thoroughly revealed to you. So yeah, you know me, he's saying. I've spent time with you. You know my works. You know what I'm like. You know everything about me. Did I commit a sin? in abasing myself that you might be exalted because I preached to you the gospel of God free of charge. Yeah, you'll see what he means by that in a minute. I robbed other churches by accepting wages from them so I could serve you guys. Furthermore, when I was present with you and I was lacking, I was a burden to no one. So I didn't, it's a similar thing, I wasn't chargeable to you. You didn't help me. I burdened, I didn't burden you, I worked for myself. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied what I lacked. In all things, I have kept myself from being burdensome to you, and so will I keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no one shall stop me from this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows why. And I will continue doing what I am doing, so that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be found equal to us in what they boast about. So... It goes on as well to explain the context of what he's saying, but he's talking about there. Um, Where's the folly bit? It hasn't actually started so much yet. Um, <laughs> but, what was I going to say? He talks about in a minute how these false apostles, they are there making money off these people. They're paying them and taking advantage of them and being a burden to them. Um, and he's saying, well, oh, Maybe I should have done that then. Like, he's saying, I worked my socks off to, to preach you. I even robbed other churches so I could be free of charge, not burden you. And you're preferring these guys who are like robbing you. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> You'll see that. He explains that in a moment. Uh, so this is why he's, this is the preamble to that. Um, I will continue what I'm doing so that I may cut off the opportunity from those. So I will continue ministering to you for free. I'm paying my own way so that I can cut <laughs> off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be found equal to us in what they boast about. For such are false apostles, and they are deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also disguise themselves as ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Amazing. So these guys will prove themselves to be, they will seem like they are ministers of righteousness, servants of righteousness, but, yeah, but their works will prove out. I really like 12, um, and I will continue doing what I'm doing, that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be found equal in us, and what they boast about, because he knows they won't do it for free. Yeah, indeed. So like, this is why I'm going to continue doing it, yeah. because I know for a fact they will not do it I've for free. I've proved by the way I'm doing so my things. 
it says in a minute as well, yeah. I prove by the way I do it, my motives are good, yeah. <laughs> basically. And they prove by the, what they're doing that their motives yeah. aren't good. So I say again, now this is where the, the what he's referred to as let me be a fool comes in now. Um, I say again, let no one think that I am a fool. Otherwise, at least receive me as a fool so that I may boast a little. Okay, so he's going to boast in his way now, in a, in a way to set himself against these false apostles. What I speak, I speak not according to the Lord, but as it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting. So he's going to, yeah, he's being somewhat facetious now. As we're saying, this, point. this is where I'm going to be. Foolish Iron, now. Um, yeah, and ironic, now. yeah, ironic yeah. And, and facetious, yeah. Seeing that many boast according to the flesh, I will also boast, because you tolerate fools gladly, seeing that you yourselves are wise. For you permit if a man, now he's talking about what these apostles are doing, if you permit if a man brings you into bondage, if a man devours you, if a man takes from you and exalts himself, or if a man strikes you on the face, he's saying that. You're loving these guys who are um, bringing you into bondage, devouring you, taking your goods, exalting themselves, striking you across the face. You're putting up with, you're loving these guys, these false apostles, these false teachers, and they're talking badly against me <laughs> because I'm meek and humble among you and I'm lowly and I served you for free. I say to my reproach that we were too weak for that, to, to strike them across the face or to take them He's saying, like, that's the sarcastic bit. He's like, wow, gosh, we should have struck you across the face and taken your goods and screwed you over. Then you would have, you know, thought we were wonderful. Mm -hmm. We were too weak to do that. These guys must be wonderful. But whenever anyone is bold, look, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. And now he says, this is his false boasting as well now, because, because he's not trying to brag, he's trying to make his point. Being sarcastic, look, are they Hebrews? It's true what he's saying as well, though, but he's not bigging himself up. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? No, they're not. I speak as a fool. I am more. And now he says, look, the way they're bigging themselves up, this is how he's now going to big himself up. Look, In labors are more abundant. In stripes, above measure. Like I've had far more beatings than them. In prisons, I've been to prison more frequently. In deaths often, five times I received from the Jews, 40 lashes minus one, I 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. That was at the hand of the Romans, we read about in Acts. Once I was stoned, we read about that in Acts as well. He was left for dead and dragged out of the city and then the brothers gathered around him and he came back. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I suffered shipwrecked. And night and day I've been in the deep, which is in the sea. In journeys often. In perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen. That was his fellow Syrians and his fellow, because he's from Syria. In perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, and in perils among false brothers. So he also got sufferings from false brothers, those apparent who were with him and abandoned him. In weariness and painfulness, in sleeplessness often. In hunger and thirst, in fastings often, and in cold and nakedness. So this is Paul's bragging about this is his qualifications for an apostle. Basically how he's suffered at the hands of everybody and done everything for the gospel and been hungry and shipwrecked and famined and beaten and stoned by the Gentiles and by the Jews and everyone persecuting him for the gospel. Um, whereas these guys are getting rich off of them and living the good life. Besides the external things, the care, besides all of this, all these things that happen externally, the care of all the churches pressures me daily. He says, I also have that burden of worrying about the flock. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is led into sin and I am not distressed? So that's, the, that's the care of the churches. Talking about how he was, for example, so distressed and with many tears wrote the first letter, rebuking the church for the sin. He's saying when anyone falls into sin, I'm very upset by that. If I must boast, I will boast of the things which concern my weakness. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who is blessed forevermore, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under King Areta, Aratas secured the city of the Damascenes with a garrison, wanting to arrest me, but I was let down by the wall through a window in a basket and escaped his hand. So that we read about that. That was in Acts chapter 9, verse 40, around there. Um, yeah, we read about that in Acts 9 when he was they were going to arrest him and they stuck him out of the window, the disciples did, out of Damascus and Syria. So this is Paul's boasting now. Doubtless it is not profitable for me to boast. So I will move on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ, and he's referring to himself here, but he's still talking in this, this um, ironic way. I knew a man in Christ over 14 years ago. Whether in the body or out of the body, I can't tell, but God knows. Such a man was caught up to the third heaven. So this is the thing we're talking about, about the, the three heavens, essentially, the first heaven being the sky, second heaven, the firmament and the stars and everything, and the third heaven is real heaven where God is and the angels are and the throne of God is. I was caught up to the third heaven and I knew that such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, but God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words not permitted for a man to say. So Paul was given um, you know, great revelations by Christ and was in heaven before the throne and given his, his ministry essentially. Of such a person I will boast. Yet of myself I will not boast, except in my weaknesses. For if I desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. So he's saying if I did, if I was going to boast about my qualifications, I wouldn't be boasting because I'd be telling the truth, but I'm not going to. Because instead, I'm going to boast in my weakness, so the power of God will be with me. But now I resist. I resist the temptation to boast. Least anyone should think of me above that which he sees me to be, or hears from me. So it's quite important. So um, there are times, you know, where we could we could go on about our qualifications, our education, our um, credentials, you know, our studies, maybe perhaps Bible colleges or professional qualifications or things that we've done. But he's saying he doesn't want anyone to think above him that which they've seen or heard from him essentially he could pick himself up like these other apostles but he's not he's just saying let you you get what you see essentially because he wants to be humble so because the power of god will rest on him then and least i should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations and you can see how humility is so important now god himself gives a, a message of satan to keep Paul humble because of what he's been shown a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan. So a messenger, an angel of Satan was sent to Paul to torment him, lest he be exalted above measure because of the exceeding revelations that he'd been given. I asked the Lord three times that this thing might depart from me, this thing, this messenger of Satan. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you because my strength is made perfect in weakness. I love Hallelujah. That. I love that. I always uh, think of that. And people think that the thorn in the flesh is a physical ailment of Paul, but it's quite obviously not, is it? It's a messenger it's quite of Satan. It's obviously a spiritual oppression. Yeah. Yeah. We sent the messenger of Satan to keep him humble so that he wouldn't get puffed up because of all the incredible the revelations that God has given him. Yeah. Mm. He needs to keep humble. Because. Christ's strength is made perfect in our weakness. Mm. So therefore, most gladly I will boast in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So that is when we have to be weak and stay humble so the power of God is with us rather than try and boast in our flesh and then we'll just be in the flesh. It sounds like self-depreciation if you're boasting in your weaknesses. Mm. Well, it's about boasting in God, boasting in his power. Um yeah, that was the point he was kind of making, was that I'll, all right, I'll boast about being persecuted mm. and being poor and being naked and cold and everything. and Because uh, God uses the humble. Yeah, he God exalts, exalts the humble, humble but brings low That's the like the qualification God wants. He wants you to be humble and then he will use you mightily. So that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 
So I take pleasure in weaknesses. I take pleasure in reproaches, in hardships, in persecution, and in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Mm. So when we're weak, we're strong. That's why in that song, um, it always makes me think of when we're looking at, I think it was, was it Majesty? No. Um, and now let the weak say I am strong. I always think, and let the strong say I am weak. That's better. What the Lord has done for us. Because that's the important thing is, yeah, let the weak say, let the strong say I am weak. Paul's concern for the Corinthian church. I have become a fool in boasting. You have compelled me. You've made me do it. I had to, you know, this is what you're talking about. Everything he just said. He became, made himself a fool by boasting. Oh, because he didn't want to boast. He doesn't boast. But because they're challenging his... Authority and his, apostleship like, and everything. Um, his, qualifications. Yeah. Because the, these other guys have come along boasting. He's like, all right then, well, if you want to know. Yeah. But I exactly. didn't feel the need to tell you. I'm going to be a fool because you compelled me to make my point and he's done it in a kind of ironic way to distinguish himself from these false apostles that they're boasting in their worldly wisdom, their strength, their flesh, their, all these things. He's saying, all right, I'll boast. I'll boast. I've been beaten by the Jews. Yeah. I've been beaten by the Romans. Paul's sassiness shipped. has come out in this chapter. <laughs> <laughs> he's very, well, you see, there's always all the scathing stuff in from Jesus in the four Gospels, in all the New Testament letters, the really harsh, scathing, strong stuff is always aimed at false teachers and false prophets. That's the harshest stuff. It's like the vitriol. All the hatred is for false teachers and false prophets. But that's what it is, though. False, well, less. False teachers and false prophets are the worst. Yeah. Because they destroy the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. Yeah, lead people astray and lead yeah. people towards... They're killing people, really. Mm. Murderers. Yeah, because that we just thought like the most important thing is spiritual salvation, and they they destroy that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Is. Using the word of God, peddling the word of God, twisting it, using it deceitfully to their own ends, and trying to make their own things come across. So. Like atheists say, "Oh my God." Kind of. Yeah, that's a form of blasphemy. Yeah. Using God's name in vain, essentially, and, and right. doing things. But equally, it can be. Doing yeah. things in the name of God that aren't his will and like claiming to be his child and representing him and living a life really contrary I and see. making him look bad. Yeah, you see, see some people who do who say, oh, I'm a Christian and then do terrible things. Mm. People are like, wow, doesn't say much about your Jesus, then, does it? I was thinking of like little things that help blasphemous terms that we said earlier is that God knows that people can say it like blasphemous, but... Then really, if it's said in the right heart, it's like a real thing. God knows. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, God knows. God yeah. Does know. God Only God knows. knows. This yeah. is why I get so yeah. frustrated yeah. with the term, oh my God, being used by like people just so lightly. Because sometimes in prayer, so, I want to say yeah. like, oh my God. Yeah, I, I do say it but sometimes then, intentionally yeah. Yeah. I feel in praise. torn when I say it because I know this context that the world uses it. Yeah. Like, Lord knows our hearts anyway, yeah. yeah, it's, like, yeah it's, it's even the same as... Um, you know, Jesus Christ, because today in a meeting, somebody, a colleague said, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And I sort of, sort of like spiritually like, but then the flesh is like, oh, why are you even, so oh, yeah, I wanted yeah. to say something because no one says on meetings, no one goes Allah or anything or like, yeah. oh, Vishnu or Buddha and oh, a swear word. Never. For Buddha's sake, like, but they use our God to, to curse. And I was like, yeah. my dad used I want to like put, put a, um, complaint in. My dad would Jesus always say that that is proof in itself. Proof. Yeah. That Absolutely, Christ yeah. is the is the one true God. Yeah, because yeah. why would their no spirit? Yeah, because um, we know that Satan is the ruler of this earth. He ain't going to curse his own He's not minions, curse is he? His own minions, he no, uses he'll curse the one true God. Absolutely, yeah. So that is like really leading his children evidence. to curse the one true Savior. That's when yeah. says, oh. And because he knows that they're not going to, why would he tempt them to sin? Something God's not going to care about. If I went around all, every time I stopped on turf, I went, "Oh, Buddha's sake!" God would be like, "Yeah, I'm with you." Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> These people aren't going to get told off for cursing other gods. They'll be, you know, probably praised for it, but they will be held accountable for every time they said, oh, Jesus Christ, as a swear word, or, mm. oh, my God, in a, you know, in a vain way. Yeah. Um, so, so I've heard a lot of times actually sort of use mind, mindlessly, isn't it? It's not like it's a, they're using it against God, but they are good. Don't realize what they're doing. Yeah, no, they don't know. They don't realize Satan is just—it's their spirit. They're walking, yeah. falling to the spirit of the world. Too often, think, so 
so I see sort of just like where it sort of came from. I mean, it was probably from back in the day, lots of people praising the name of the Lord or something, or using the Lord's name rightly, and maybe it's got like, I don't know, yeah, taken. I don't know, it's just interesting how it's become to that the mm. stage it is now, mm. how it's what's so widely used in such a blasphemous way. I think yeah. it might have come from, like so in this like, country, yeah. this country was so, it was, was much stronger in Christian faith yeah. hundreds of years ago. Um, and And I think, you know, I've definitely committed this offence. When you get angry about something, you do, sh like I, I have in the past, and I know that I shouldn't, and I don't do it now, um, but before I've gone like, Lord, why? Why do you let this happen to me, Lord? I can't, but we shouldn't do that. But maybe that's where it stems from, yeah. like people calling out like the name yeah. of Jesus because of that, yeah, and then yeah. it's evolved then into like a, yeah. an angry kind of response. Maybe it's I feel like you're like, allowed to say it because you're a Christian, but... No, but we and shouldn't you recognise that you're a Christian, whereas I think a lot of people are Christian. They it depends on the intention. Yeah, you're saying it depends. It, but we shouldn't. Like, if I, for example, if uh, like if I'm having a day and everything's going wrong, I shouldn't be calling up to the throne in anger, blaming God. Blaming for God. No, that, like, was, that was no, the yeah. mistake made in Job. You know, uh, they were we getting told off for that. A falsely attributing. And when I was a younger, falsely Christian, attributing the works of Satan to God is one is one sin. Because there's bad things that Satan does that people blame God for as well, and blaming God of any kind of wrongdoing because He never does anything bad or wrong, or He only gives good gifts and yeah. So, and when you meet God face to face, you'll realise, like that you can't like He's just so powerful yeah. that you just think, wow, how dare I? Like, you do what you want, God. Yeah, you could literally just and you die. <laughs> And he's done so much for us and given us so much yeah. that we've got no grounds to be accusing him or blaming him. Yeah. I think we've can he die for us? Oh, yeah, we do. Oh, gosh, yeah. Flesh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just, it's so, I think I'm really wound up for God's sake. Yeah. 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 But I do it. That's flesh, though, isn't it? That's the fight with <laughs> flesh. That's yeah. what Paul says. That's the horrible thing, isn't it, that we can't wait to be freed of, is the flesh that yeah. does these things. And you're like, what are you doing to me? Like, why have you, you know. Yeah. Crucify you, you know, your flesh. You want to hate the flesh, yeah. I think Paul went through that. Cause he, that's why he talks about, I beat my flesh into submission. Yeah, and talk about in Romans as well. Wretched man that. that I am, who will free me from this body of death, yeah. Because yeah. we do the things we don't want to do, yeah. yeah that's, that's the thing that will be gone. That In this life, we can get rid of iniquity in a heart, like willful sin, stuff that we choose to do. But sadly, we'll never be completely free of sins of the flesh, the stuff that just automatically just happens accidentally. We'll never be completely free of that while we're in this cursed body, essentially. Um, no, it's not an excuse. <laughs> well, there's, no, there's never an excuse for the, for the willful stuff you chose to do. It all works in progress. No, exactly. It does diminish. And you can be free, like when you're full of the Holy Spirit and anointed and being led by God, but that. From my experience, and I don't know anybody who can walk in that way permanently. Mm -hmm. I don't think yeah. even John the Baptist, you know, and he was. Well, the it's greatest. that saying, isn't it, where if you reach for the like, so this is about how godly or how holy you want to be. Yeah, if you aim for holiness at the level of the mountains, you'll fall into the sea when you fail. If you aim for holiness at the level of the stars, you'll fall onto the mountains when you fail. If you aim for holiness like Christ, you'll fall onto the stars. But if you aim, aim to be as holy as God the Father, you'll then fall to be like Christ when you stumble. Hopefully, yeah. Oh, so Imitators of God. I like oh, imitate God. Aim for like, perfection, yeah. Yeah, we are little human. Yeah, that's the, yeah, that's the annoying thing. <laughs> I hate it. It's quite it's like, just, <laughs> you've got to look at it as like an experiment, though. Sometimes I look at it as an experiment. Like I'll wake up in the morning and I'll think, right, I'm going to try my hardest to be like as holy as God today, like in all my actions, the way I speak to either, the way I speak, and you don't last very long. But it's quite, but it's quite interesting to like, and you do feel like carried when you do it. Like you do feel like the Holy Spirit's kind of carrying you when you have that desire to want to do it. Yeah, the key, the key to that is God, yeah. the Holy Spirit, just drawing close to Him as possible through prayer, through reading the Word, through just spending time in His presence. And surrendering and asking him, Lord, what is your will? And then just following what he tells you. You can't, the, 
that's the only key is being close to him because it, all the power to walk in holiness comes from the Holy Spirit, comes from him. Whereas the more you're just kind of being in the flesh worldly and just trying, you can't do it in your flesh even for 10 minutes. Mm. But like if you're under, if you're full of the Holy Spirit and under the anointing, you can like walk flawlessly for a time, maybe a couple of days or something. As soon as you go off on your own will again, gender, you're just back, you're back in the flesh again. You probably can't go an hour without me, I just, it for me, a few I hours. I think that my biggest battle and the thing I would love the most and I think the Bible talks about it that it is everyone's battle, is just being able to control this thing. Yeah, I know. That's like, just to be able to be silent in those moments, then you wouldn't, you wouldn't <laughs> sin, do you know what I mean? But it's so I think, hard. I think <laughs> everybody here, apart from Jack, missed the James book, so we'll do James again at the end. Maybe we'll stick it in after Romans or something, because it's such important to in there. But it just that's what it all comes down to, controlling our tongue bridle it, be slow to it speak. It says it's the smallest member, but it causes the most damage. Yeah, and it says if you can control your tongue, you can be a perfect man, basically a woman. Yeah. I've got a text it, because it's not literally speaking, it's like communicating. Yeah. Yeah. That's Think what before sometimes, you Sometimes, like yeah. when, especially when, like, so when you're doing up a house ready for sale, anything like that, it can create a toll on your marriage, for sure. Like you're challenged, like, you know, because you kind of get upset with each other. And yeah, sometimes I just think to myself, I wish I could just the way Jesus did in front of the Pharisees at the, at the very end. He was just silent. They just they slapped him. He kept slapping mocking him in the face, him, and falsely mocking accusing. Him. And he had so much control. He just remained silent. Like that's the example that I think about. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. 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 He's got that word for those yeah. to do things. Yeah. 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 So it's 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 not all sorts doing it. Yeah. But I think you have to desire to want to be that way. Yeah. You desire and seek God. Yeah. yeah. And then God when you're you, close yeah. to him, it naturally flows from the Holy Spirit, yeah. Fruits of the Spirit. Um that's what it's all about. So, um I've become a fool in boasting. You have compelled me, for I should I ought to have been commended by you, for I am in no way inferior to the leading apostles, though I am nothing. So he's saying that you should have been commending me to these false apostles. I'm not inferior to these leading apostles, these super apostles, though I am nothing. Truly, the signs of an apostle were performed among you. And these, this is, he's talking about himself again now. These are what, these are his signs. Patience. Signs and wonders and mighty deeds. These are things that he did among them. For in what respect were you inferior to the other churches? Unless it be that I myself was not burdensome to you. Forgive me for this wrong. Do you know what I mean? He's being sarcastic there, saying, I didn't, I wasn't a burden to you. Sorry, I, maybe I should have been a burden to you. Forgive me for wronging you in this way, that I wasn't a burden to you. I am ready to come to you this third time. And I will not be burdensome burdensome to you for i do not seek what is yours but you this is probably again opposing to these other people he's talking about who were seeking what was theirs instead of them for the children should not ought to lay up for the parents but the parents for the children so he is their spiritual parent in the regard that he fostered them into into christ and raised them up in that way um, but this again, it's another just an important little piece of doctrine there, and it's a quote from the Old Testament as well. From the, this is essential from the law, and we know that it's all about inheritance. Some cultures actually we take that for granted, but some cultures don't have that um, wisdom and knowledge that it is for the children. Sorry, it is for the parents to lay up for their children and to bless their children, leave an inheritance. Some cultures it's the children to work and work mm -hmm. to like provide for their parents. That's what so I'm it's like a like backwards that. thing. The, in the Philippines, it's like that. Parents will have lots of children so that because their children their, will then, but then children can't help their own children because they, they commit their whole life to they stay providing in a for their parents. Of poverty, yeah, um, until that until that breaks. Um, yeah, so it should all be about the parents working hard to bless their children, so their children are better off than them. So their their children can then um, bless their okay, grandchildren, yeah. etc. Yeah, I will very gladly spend. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. If I love you more, should I be loved less by you? But be it that is, but be that as it may, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, 
being crafty, I caught you with deceit. Did I take advantage of you by any of those whom I sent to you? I urged Titus to go, and with him I sent a brother. Did Titus take advantage of you, or did we not walk in the same spirit? So Titus also wasn't chargeable to them, paid his own way. Did we not walk in the same steps? Again, do you think that we are defending ourselves to you? We speak before God in Christ. We do all things, beloved, for your edifying. For I fear that when I come, I shall not find you such as I wish, and that I shall be found, and that I shall be found by you such as you do not wish. So be angry with them. I fear there are debates. He's saying when I do turn up, I'm worried that things won't be in order, and I'm going to find you guys in debating, envying, wrath strife, fighting, arguing, backbiting, so backstabbing and talking about each other going back and whispering, arrogance and disorder, which is what was going on in the first one as well. And I fear that when I come again, my God will humble me among you and that I shall mourn for many who have sinned already, who have not repented of uncleanness, sexual immorality and lasciviousness. Yes, Sorry, lasciviousness, which they have committed. It's similar, they're all similar things. Lasciviousness is um, partying, orgies, unclean living, basically, worldly living, sexual morality, uncleanness, all this stuff basically is similar type of living, which they have committed. That's Sodom and Gomorrah, that's the. Just the world, world just general life. Friday night in centre of town lifestyle, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and he's worried that all his boasting will be in vain and that he's going to be very humbled because he'll come and find them all still sinning and they'll be really upset. How are we doing on time? Eight o'clock. What time do we start? We start time? Yeah, you Pretty did. Pretty much, isn't it? Yeah. Right, so I think we're very near the end. If One I chapter. Right, the 14, yeah. So. 14. 14 chapters in Second Corinthians, yeah. There's only 13. I only got 13. There's one more chapter, isn't there? <laughs> 13. No, yeah, yeah. 13. So this is the last one. What am I looking at then? I must have clicked on yeah, first Corinthians. Right. Oh, last chapter. You got a flippy oh. No flippy back. Please. Oh, we're doing well then. Got through this pretty quick. Oh, we can start on Romans then, which is good. We're getting into good stuff then. That'd be all the dessert. For even the first chapter is very excellent. This is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So he's sort of referring that his third time will be saying he'll witness it three times. I told you before, and I foretell as if I were present the second time, and being absent now, I am writing to those who have sinned before, and to all the others, that if I come again, I will not spare anyone. Yikes. So he's going to come and be bold, and he's going to whoop them, following the first letter, if they didn't repent. Since you seek proof of Christ speaking through me, who toward you is not weak, but is mighty in you. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. So also we are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God serving you. Amen. Look, examine yourselves, seeing whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Why would we need to examine ourselves and test ourselves? It was easy believesism, you know. <laughs> um, do you not know that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, he is not essentially, unless indeed you are disqualified. I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. Now, how could, uh, why, why would he say that, you know, they got to check that? Paul and Titus and all these people are not disqualified, given that that's not possible for anyone to be disqualified, right? Mm. I trust you will know that we are not disqualified. Now I pray to God that you do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that you should do that which is honourable, whether or not we may seem disqualified. For we can do nothing against the truth. But only, so that's quite an important little line there with regard to what we've been through recently. So he's saying that even if you think that we're not qualified, just don't do any evil, essentially. Um, 
not to like prove anything of what we've taught you, just for your own sakes, to before your God. Own even if you think that I'm, you're, even if you want to listen to these false guys who have been talking badly against me, and you think I'm not qualified, don't do any evil. <laughs> just listen to the first letter, depart from sin, and just fear God. For we can do nothing against the truth, but only for the truth. So, yeah, that kind of stands in itself. That you can't do anything against truth, but you can work with the truth. You can try and lie against it, but it doesn't change the truth, basically. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. We wish even your perfection. So he said, I'm happy that to be weak myself, as long as you guys are strong. We want you to be perfected in God. Therefore, I write these things being absent, so at least being present, so at least when I come to you, I should have to be sharp according to the authority which the Lord has given me for edification and not for destruction. They're saying, I'm going to write this letter to you. I hope you get this letter so that when I come the third time, I don't have to not spare anyone and be really sharp like I talked about before. Finally, brothers, farewell. Be perfect. Be perfect. Look at that. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind and live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. So we should be perfect, of good comfort, have one mind and yes, live in this peace. Holy kissing again. And then the love of God and love of God of, and peace will be with us. <laughs> Second time, yeah. <laughs> Greet one another with a holy kiss. <laughs> All the saints greet you. <laughs> what did I miss? You two kissing. No kissing on the back row. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Um, just one little point to notice as well as we're going through all these... Yes, <laughs> hallelujah, we got through Corinthians, thank you, heavy old doctrines. Um, notice as well, as we go through in the Bible, very, very, very rarely does it ever just say Jesus. It's always honour, it's the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus, Christ Jesus, you know what I mean? So, whereas there's a lot these days, it's like Jesus, Jesus, just a casual Jesus, and, do you know what I mean, all the time, and people kind of refer to Jesus in quite like we wouldn't call the Queen he, this. Exactly. Yeah. He is the Lord. He's a king of kings. Queen Elizabeth. He's not just majesty, like yeah. my Jesus. Yeah. He is my king, the Lord Jesus. And if the apostles who live with him and knew him refer to him in this honourable way of the Lord yeah. Jesus Christ, you know, who are we to denigrate him to just Hannah or, you know, Thomas, Marcus, Jesus. It's... Yeah. Hannah, Thomas Marcus, the Lord Jesus Christ, yes, King, King of all glory. If he was in this room with us, like, physically now, I wouldn't refer to him as Jesus. I'd refer to him as My Lord. Lord. Yeah, my yeah. Lord. My Can God. I question? Yeah. yeah. Messiah. I had a funny thought before, just like saying, Oi, Jesus, pass me the earth. Exactly, yeah. yeah God so forbid. Pass me the earth. God Everyone forbid. Everyone step away from Jack. Lightning bolt's coming. Yeah. Like, what's coming? Lightning, Lightning bolt. bolt. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> exactly yeah, yeah. yeah it's not so yeah I was like dead this kind of like modern oh hippie jesus my buddy is like so far from what is he is and so far from what will be revealed when he comes back all those people who thought jesus was just like yeah. oh my chum old jesus are going to be like on the floor on their faces mm -hmm. in terror um, says that they, they go in caves and want the mountains to fall on them to hide from the wrath of him from the Lamb. Mm. Yeah, so we should revere and honour the Lord Jesus Christ with all our hearts and minds and Who, souls. My friend had a vision of that, kind of, didn't she? Um, my friend Rebecca, who had the dream of the whole of Revelation. Before that night, she had a... Um, quite a few years ago actually when Marcus and I lived in London she came and stayed with us because she had some auditions to go to and it's funny how whenever she's with us she always has like biblical dreams um, and she uh, had a dream she woke up and she said I was in a I was in a cave in a mountain and every time like um, she said it was very very clear she said in this dream that they had to hide like they had to hide mm. 
They yeah. were climbing in the rocks and going into caves to hide. To hide, yeah. Mm. And I showed her that scripture. And then, and then later on in the dream, there was even like pale horses and stuff. Mm. Crazy. Mm -hmm. Right, so Romans. So we're now, this was um, a couple of years after Corinthians. Um, 1 Corinthians was about 57 AD, 56. Second Corinthians was written about a year later. And um, the letters of the Romans, Paul hasn't been to Rome yet, but he's heard about um, Christians in Rome. And he's writing to Rome and he desires to go to Rome because he knows that Rome is like, um, oh gosh, there's not even equivalent really today, but London of the British Empire. When the British Empire was all over the world, London was the capital of the world. Rome at that time was the capital of the world. Everyone knew Rome, everything went through Rome. It was the centre of commerce, of trade, of religion. Wall Street. That's just finance yeah. though, but it was the hub of everything because the Roman Empire was seated in Rome. So he wants to go to Rome to preach the gospel in Rome because it's like if I can get to the belly of the beast. Yeah, if I can get London to convert, if I can get Rome to convert, that will then go across the world, which it did with the Roman Catholic Church, but sadly got corrupted over time and is now what it is today. But obviously, to begin with, when Christianity became the official religion of Rome, that kind of they started then converting it everywhere else, and it was a good thing. Um, has all big things. Um, Love and money corrupts. Yeah. Just because I know it's the hiker's hip. So we're going to just, we're going until half past eight. Well, Let so we I did the recording. So we're currently on one minute 36. So 25 minutes of Romans. That would be two, our two hours then. Yeah. Yeah. So that would make it to nine? No, no, no. Um, just after half past eight. Yeah. Okay. So Romans chapter one. And this is an amazing, amazing piece of literature. Probably one of the greatest writings ever written by anybody in the history of the world. So, Paul, and there's a lot in this. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, there will be a few weeks on this one, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, which he beforehand promised through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Okay, so that's fine. So he's just saying that Paul was called by Jesus and set apart specifically for the Gentiles, which we know. Um, God has promised all of this beforehand through all the writings about Jesus from the Psalms and the prophets and all of the um, all of the scriptures and the Lord Moses. He promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. We know that Jesus was a descendant of David's line which was prophesied, and he was, hmm? so King David is um, king of, his, of, of Israel, of Jerusalem from the Old Testament, the right. famous king. and Jesus was a physical descendant from, from David, basically. Because of Mary. Yeah, and, and his father, yeah, on both sides. He Jesus was. didn't have a father, he was immaculate. So, exactly, but through, that's why he says according to the flesh, basically, his dad being Joseph and his mum they both traced the lineage back to David basically because that was that was the promised prophecy that he would be from the line of David. Blood wise it's through Mary yeah, yeah. Mary's a descendant of David but then God even then said that the earthly man who will stand as a father as for a my dad, son yeah. will also be from the line of David. So they were both uh, from, so they were both yeah, from the line of David. Joseph wasn't his dad as in like biological, biological no. no. Right, got it. According to the flesh means like in the matter. Duty, the duty you had to Yeah, physicality. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. So the resurrection of the dead is the proof that Jesus is the son of God. And the power and the miracles that he did also prove, that's why it says, according to be the Son of God with power. Identification there. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of holiness that people not forget. So people who claim to have the Holy Spirit acting in a very unholy way. I can't remember have that. The Holy no, or that he is certainly grieved or withdrawn from them. Um, certainly for that time, because he is a holy spirit. Through him... We have received grace 
and apostleship for the obedience of faith among all nations for his name, among whom you are also called by Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, they're called to be saints. And there's also times where he refers to people as saints. So we are saints and we're called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Paul desired to visit Rome. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all because your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. So everybody's heard about this. Um, and uh, Priscilla and Aquila go there. The, in the movie, the Apostle Paul, that's set in Rome. This is about that sect of Christians hiding out in Rome, essentially. So when Paul wrote this, is that based Bef on what? That was before the great persecution in Rome had begun. That so happened that's under before Nip. Paul goes to Rome. And is this is before he's ever been. Yeah, yeah. He goes after. He does go. He goes twice, I think. Yeah, he does go twice. And ultimately gets so martyred there. Before the film. Before the film, yeah. He dies in Rome at the end of that film. Writes his second letter to Timothy, which is his last ever letter. And then is killed. Um, so, um, so he's heard about this. these Christians in Rome. And everybody's heard about them, that their faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, making request if, by any means, now at last I might find a way in the will of God to come to you. So he really wants to go there to Rome and help them and see them, and he does get to. No, Paul, don't go. <laughs> Sorry, it goes twice. First time he goes, he doesn't die. He does get in prison, but he gets let out again. For I long to see you. Yeah. Verse eleven. Yeah. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be strengthened. This is so that I may be encouraged together with you by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Now, I would not have you unaware, brothers that I often intended to come to you, but I was prevented until now, that I might have a harvest among you also, even as among the other Gentiles. So he'd been wanting to go to Rome and evangelise for a while, but it's not, not in God's timing. I am a debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. So when he says he's a debtor, it means he's debtor to all mankind to preach the gospel. Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. He has the burden to preach to everybody. The definition of the gospel. So the guilt of mankind bit, that's the bit I was on about earlier, when you're talking about people are standing on the shoulders of God and not even appreciating it. This is all about that coming up. It's a wonderful piece of writing. Yeah, that's um, what I should say, standing on the shoulders of God, not mm. Christians, because God acts through Christians. And, and built this country, yeah. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Amen. Amen. We are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And we live by faith in regards to jobs, works, houses, etc. Mm -hmm. The guilt of mankind. So, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth through unrighteousness. For what may be known about God is clear to them since God has shown it to them. The invisible things about him, even his eternal power and deity, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world and are understood by the things that are made, so that they are without excuse. So everything we need to know about God, the proof of God, is all around us in the very creation, the way the world is ordered, the glory of God, the food that grows out the ground. Everybody intrinsically knows that they are created in, a, in, in, in glory. So they've got no excuse at all, because the world itself is a testament of God. Creation itself is a testament of God. That's why until recently, that was well known, but then from kind of dark in the last, because we're getting into the last days since what the sort of last hundred years or so, even less, 
Darwinism and all this Big Bang theory and all this alternate history, alternate creation, false science theories have started to come up to pollute people away from the basics of of the world around them, basically, because people will just be like, "Wow, well, clearly, you know, there's God, because look at this." But now it's like, "Oh, this was an accidental explosion that rendered all this perfect order and beauty and perfection and symmetry and the um, what was the, the mathematical thing we talked about the day? Fibonacci. Fibonacci and the golden ratio and all of that and all these things just just chance happened, you know? How many explosions would have to happen in an iPhone factory until the perfect iPhone came out the door? You know, yeah. do it for a billion years, shake the box, and oh, all the parts went together and made it. <laughs> And, and even a bird is like infinitely more complex and advanced than an iPhone. But yeah, yeah. what were you say? No, I was just going to say the version of that. Um, I was talking to him, he was actually um, interviewing me for some painting thing, but um, we were talking about sort of inspiration. That I was talking about like theories of the world and Lord and like how perfect and intricate everything is. And the Lord just brought it to me is like the idea of like a things a big bang theory like something exploding like you say making something so precise and um yeah the lord brought me an idea of like um put an egg in a microwave mm. and it explodes like you don't get like a chicken yeah yeah yeah, exactly, like, yeah. Come out of, like, you do not so, get perfection from chaos explosions yeah. don't produce yeah. like beautiful perfect things it's so stupid yeah, yeah. but but that's what it says god gave them over to believe this nonsense yeah. now look. but the thing is as well the other thing because it frustrates me. This is why we want to be mortgage-free, because we want to pay for Isla to go to this school that teaches crea creationism as, you know, it's a Christian school. Because in schools nowadays, they teach evolution as fact, and it's not, it's theory. Yeah, it's yeah, always it's just has a theory. been a theory. Um, and, like, I was speaking to my cousin quite a few years ago about it, and I said, look, you know, we, they, they say that monkeys have evolved, you know, why so drastically. <laughs> why have they stopped revolving? Why have they stopped evolving? Mm. You know, in the last I don't know how many thousands of years, why have we? Why has monkeys just stopped now? Like, yeah. why do we even have monkeys anymore? Why haven't they? I thought all they just evolved, evolved into humans? us. <laughs> like, yeah. there's millions of things, but anyway. Yeah. So this is common sense to us, but this is what happens. So, um, because they, although they knew God, because they did not glorify Him or give Him thanks as God but became futile in their imaginations. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be white, they became fools. So all these people, they, uh, you know, these, um, who's the kind of famous, like, oh, what's that, Brian Coxon, all these sort of people who like, talk all this stuff, they were so smart and wise, they were actually just fools. Um, claiming to be wise, they became fools. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. He's talking about so idols. So idol worshipping, yeah? They're, just, they're hardening their heart. They're getting stupid imaginations and made-up things in their heads. They're claiming to be wise. God gives them over to this, right? Therefore, God gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their heart to dishonour their own bodies amongst themselves. So that's talking about sexual morality. They turned the truth of God into a lie and they worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. So this is why I'm always mm. sort of nipping out anything about the sun being God or anything like that or like any form of physics, anything of the earth, any worship of the creation instead of the creator because we should never worship stars or animals or anything made but God who created all these things. Mm. Also, there's scientists that have all these awards for supposedly discovering things that aren't even true. Like crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a whole one. Look at NASA. Like the whole thing is like this massive multi-billion-dollar industry, just based on the lie, just to make just the most of it is money laundering and just getting money for old rope, isn't it? There's a lot of money in it be taken from innocent, hardworking people because it's all it's all corporately based. It's all funded by the American government, taken from the taxpayers. Oh well. They turned the truth of God into a lie, and they worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonourable passions. And look what happens to these people. Their women exchanged their natural function for what is against nature. So that's Lesbian. lesbians. Likewise, the men, leaving the natural function of the woman, burned in their lust towards one another. Men with men doing that which is shameful, and receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error. 
Is that like AIDS and stuff? Because that's where it comes from, doesn't it? Like Sexually transmitted diseases, yeah. Certainly uh, are a, a fruit. That's of why um, Freddie Murphy got like AIDS that. through um, homosexual. homosexual intercourse. Yeah. Massive pandemic in the 80s, wasn't it? When As soon as homosexuality became legal, obviously it proliferated, and, and then you AIDS had the AIDS increased. outbreak yeah. and millions were dying of it, yeah. But they received in themselves the penalty of their error because they were burning with lust one to another. But God gave them up to that because they won't honour him, they harden their harden their um, hearts and minds, yeah. And because, this is what you were talking about, people not being grateful, they did not see fit to acknowledge God, they won't acknowledge him for anything they have, their blessings, because they did not see fit to acknowledge him, God gave them over to a debased mind, to do those things which are not proper. And look what happens, they get filled, they are filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, which is also idolatry, maliciousness, they were full of envy, murder, strife and deceit. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, proud and boastful, inventors of evil things and disobedient towards their parents. They do not have understanding, they are covenant breakers, Without natural affection, they are calloused and unmerciful. Who know the righteous requirement of God, that those who commit these things are worthy of death. They do not only do them, but they also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Yeah. And it's interesting there that it says God gave them over to that, to yeah. all those things, because, because they, they did not acknowledge that he was God. Yeah. So that's what happens to people as they go on through life, hardening the heart more and more, becoming more and more atheist. They produce more, and I know that to be true of myself, like being an atheist in the past um, was probably guilty of, you know, all of those things pretty much. Um, and that's the fruits of it. That's what, that's what we produce if we deny God and go against him. Um, and notice how as well, it says they give hearty approval to those who practice them. So, not only are all of these things sin, but there are people who, through, they approve of these things and take yeah. enjoyment in these things, like through soaps and films and enjoying like other people doing this stuff, watching it, taking part in it in that way, you know? And That's just church, as bad. More recently, so now. It's starting far, to. The further it's fallen, because obviously we're in the last days, so it's known that the church is falling further and further away. They're now approving homosexual. Gossip, and yeah, oh my gosh, yeah. Even in the pastors. priests, yeah. Yeah. Even transgender pastors as well. There's um that man who was wearing a wig and he started home and he started a hormone replacement therapy, so he's growing breasts now and stuff, and he's yeah. like an ordained pastor in the church. Like. In Brazil, yeah. And obviously we've got lesbian female Anglic lesbian female Anglican ministers in the Church of England now yeah. as well. Yeah, who are openly lesbian, openly women and yeah. leaders. But this is like tradition. all the like any any person that ordains or says that's okay for a teacher to be in that position doing those things is an antichrist. Absolutely, because it's it's doing this thing here. They don't want to acknowledge God's co commandment in it, so yeah. it gives them over to it, doesn't it? And whatever they claim, they don't love Jesus. They don't know Him at all, because those who love Him keep His commands. Mm. How can we um, help them? <laughs> Prayer, fasting. <laughs> I mean, you know, they, they want to come them? to church. I mean, the Methodist church welcomes them. They're, they're part of the group. It's mm -hmm. like the I see it like. Oh, who? Are you, sorry, who are you talking about? I thought you meant the the priests within the Church of England. Oh, you, you mean, mean who do you mean? People who want to come to Christ. They want to come to church. You know, uh, who? gay people and lesbian people. Yeah. Want to come to church. Mm -hmm. How how are ministers supposed to deal with them? It's a very good question. Accept yeah. them and love mm. them. Um, it's an unfortunate necessity, like war. We don't want to do war, but sometimes people come at you and you have to defend yourself, to defend God. And, mm -hmm. and so with, I thought a lot about this, which is why I'm speaking with Pope. You know, I'm being called to speak right now. Being, and, and what you were saying earlier about that there's a, you can be that way, but don't be open about it or allow or help people to accept it, I suppose. I guess you're saying, like, love them, yeah. but you have to just let the word of God and say, we have to stand on this. And if they reject it, then that's that's verse 28. They're, they're not acknowledging God's command. 
Well, what's um, what's Jabri, what's Jabri's testimony about that? Because um, she mm. was a, a practicing lesbian. But there's also a difference between practicing and something and just like having that temptation. Some yeah. people might identify, think in their head, thinking oh, I'm gay, but know that God doesn't want them to do it, so just don't do it. Yeah, flesh. Yeah. Which is fine because like we all get tempted by things that aren't of God and we don't do them because mm. we know that's not God's will. But what happened? Flesh. Exactly. Yeah. What happened with um, Jabri? Because I know she was. Did she had a girlfriend, so did she, I think? Um, yeah, well, I think I think the Lord delivered her from it. I think when she was baptised, that just went. So oh, she wow. had no interest in it. Wow. Okay, wow. Well, and yeah, she knew, the, and she, in wow. her testament, because I was watching it on YouTube, I think she was told God's stance on it. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. Like, they didn't, they didn't, they weren't, apolog like Jack's saying, you can't be apologetic for it. Yeah. Like, you just have, this is what, you can't kind of, like, soften it. You And they'll either... If they accept it, then you know that God's granting them repentance and yeah. they're predestined and ordained to freedom from it. If they're not, yeah. then they don't. That's all we can yeah, do to pray for them. Explain. It's like, I can't remember when you explained it before, when I'm talking to people who are evangelizing, it's like, you know, the Lord, you know, that's what the Lord said. It's the Lord said that, you know, the Lord wants us to not apply. If we were, you know, all homosexual, we wouldn't be here. Like, mm. you know, we continue. Like, yeah. You know, mm. it's not like... So what Jack said, well, it's not our place to condemn those doing yeah. that. It's, you know, we're supposed to love everyone. The Lord has loved yeah. us, but yeah, it's really, it's, mm. yeah, sure, I'm sticking by the word. And, and it, God, it is tricky. <laughs> and God wants an obedience. He wants obedience, doesn't he? Yeah. yeah. So if people hear it and they reject it and they're like, well, I don't want your God then, he's, God's not going to want them because God wants an yeah. obedient yeah, servant. God would be fine with that. But yeah. I think that what's happened like these days is that it used to be just another another sin. Yeah, mm -hmm. homosexuality, cheating on your wife, adultery, um, you know, murder, whatever. They're just things that are against God's will and were covenant breaking. But now it's become a very personal identity thing. It's become a whole identity. It's not just another sin. Oh, you don't yeah. have a man who's like. I'm an adulterer. I go to adultery pride. I proudly cheat on my wife and I'm proud to do it. I put a sticker on my car and I want everyone to, at work to know I'm an adulterer, you know? But it's the same as that. But people have yeah. made it this pride thing. Yeah, I'm a homosexual. I go to a, go to a, a parade and you're forbidden to say anything about it because it's like a personal attack, you know? It's like, People are identifying with their sin in this. I think the suffering is greater than other people's. Everyone has challenges of the flesh. Mm, exactly. And to think that that your that you suffer more because of your challenge of the flesh, therefore you have to protest is just sin. Isn't yeah, it? exactly. Is you're putting yourself above other people. Yeah. And making right. that making this thing become some proud like thing greater than other things that are against God, do you know what I mean? Like it's mm. quite scary that you know, these protected characteristic things that you're going against the law if you discriminate up against someone based on that. Well I could lose my job if I was like you shouldn't be gay to someone kind of thing as though that's nuts. Yeah. yeah. Mm. But, but again uh, we don't it, need it's to about say. outsiders though, because we're not to we're commanded not to judge outsiders. Yeah. Because there's not it says God would judge them, that they're not yeah. our business basically. We're yeah. to yeah. preach the gospel to them, preach forgiveness, tell them the truth lovingly. Our matter, our issue is within the body and within the church. To those within the body, if someone was practicing homosexuality, that's no different if they're practicing lying, practicing stealing, practicing, practicing watching porn, practicing cheating on their wife. It's exactly the same. We have to tell them this isn't God's will and don't be deceived by any, um, what's it, don't be deceived with uh, something words, it says, with deceptive words. You're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. You You're not go to going into anything. heaven doing that. I can't lie to you. You don't. You don't. Do you want me to lie mm -hmm. to you? Would yeah. you rather be deceived by people? And then on that day, Jesus says, "I never knew you." Go in the lake of fire, and you'd be like, "What?" Then find out now and be like, "Oh wow, yeah. I'm going to need to stop this sexual Which relationship exactly with this with person of the same sex. I'm going to need to break that off and either be celibate or, like with Jabri, be delivered and have a husband or have and a wife." And it works yeah. because I did that with my mum, like. I went through, sat with her. This was after I was kind of like delivered from having too many clothes and all that kind of stuff, and I did it. So I took the log out my own eye first, and then I, then I could rightly help my mum. And I just sat with my mum at Kitchen Island and just showed her the scriptures and said, Mum, look, it says here, like, do not be deceived. So he's like highlighting, please don't let anyone else deceive you. What I'm about to say is like, is the, gos is the gospel truth. If you're doing any of these things, and covetousness is one of them, you will not 
inherit the kingdom of God. And it worked, like that conviction, seeing the words there, and the right, do not be just don't let anyone deceive you away from this fact. Yeah. Because these things, these aren't um, the these aren't works. flesh sins. They're not accidental. Mm. You don't stub your toe and accidentally cheat on your wife, or accidentally get into a homosexual relationship. Mm. They're in your heart, willful rebellion that you're choosing to do that daily. You know, it's not it's not accidental or easy for me to go out and get into a relationship with a man. I'd have to go out of my way to choose to do that and pursue mm. it and act upon it daily in rebellion. Mm. Um, that can't inherit the kingdom because. Our minds and hearts aren't going to just be surgically removed and transformed. Our flesh will. We're going to get immortal bodies. But that evil needs to come out of our heart before we can be immortalized. Otherwise, we'll be in the same position as Adam and Eve. You know, that's why all this we'll has to happen. We'll be immortalized in our wickedness. We'll, all our iniquity in our heart will just be permanently stuck in, basically. So we have to internally be aligned with God so that when we're made immortal, we're sin-free. You know, because the thing keeping us sinning today is is this, you know, this mm. fret where frustration and tiredness and stress and impatience and all that comes from the flesh. We don't want to do it, but you find yourself doing it and you, you want to put to death your flesh to be closer to Jesus. But you do stuff accidentally. That's the stuff we're fighting against. That's the stuff which we will, praise God, be freed from. But if I in my heart was still like totally against God in something... That ain't going anywhere. That's my my will. Do you know what I mean? It's the same as Satan. He wants to Rebel. break God. So in terms of people coming to really long answer to your question, mm -hmm. um, it's hard. In terms of outsiders, it's certainly not our job to be condemning people and go and protest against like homosexuality like I know some have. Because they're unbelievers. It's God's job God's job to judge them. But people who want to come to the Lord I certainly don't think that should be your first conversation because they need to understand the <laughs> grace and forgiveness of God first. But at some point, they will need to be they will need to be told the truth that I think before baptism, if you really, want, it needs to be had. The conversation needs to be had before baptism. Well, yeah, you can't truly be baptized. It's a baptism of repentance, isn't it? Repent for that thing. Yeah, they, they will need to confront that side of it, as we all have to do. All of us. Yeah. We can't make it more. As you said, it's not more important. Um, we'll all, when coming to Christ, find things that. I'm going to have to stop that or let that go to come to Jesus because he says that is no good. Um, it, we can't be more precious about about this particular thing, about homosexuality. It's no different, is it, than someone who really wants to take drugs or really wants to have five wives or three girlfriends or like watch porn every day or do any of the things that, or steal or lie or do you know what I mean? People who are tied to these things, it's no different if they want to have a, a, a boyfriend and a boyfriend or a girlfriend and a girlfriend, you know. Thanks for asking that question. We'll probably get to oh, the that's end of okay. The when, I, when I lived in Manchester, Manchester one chat, the um, there's part of Manchester that is a gay part, really. Um, a gay part of Manchester. Really? Yeah, around Canal Street. And, all that. and my friend used to go evangelising around there. Uh, and, so he um, did make it the first thing <laughs> and, to talk um, about. <laughs> on one occasion, this is years ago, it was an evil spirit actually that was cast out of this game. A very perverse spirit. Yeah, no and doubt. She said when it did come out, it was really a bad smell. Wow. Um, so I do believe it is demonic. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it is. It will certainly lead to it, yeah, yeah, as well. Yeah. But you can't, again, it's that same thing, you can't open up with that in the first <laughs> conversation. <laughs> no, um, because I know spirit. people, have, <laughs> I know Christians yeah. have yeah. done so. And it's met, it's offended these people so much that they just walls go up. But um, they have to yeah. know the love of Christ first because they'll want to be repentful of that and they'll want to deny their flesh that. Christ, because of their love for Christ. Yeah. No, but this was just through prayer. Wow. She wasn't actively delivering the sound, but the Spirit left. Oh, wow. wow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise yeah. God. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, God can do anything at any yeah. time, so we can't be prescriptive about things. You yeah. never know what can happen. That's well, what. Um, but we we got to confront it eventually. It's better that we confront it and that person gets offended and goes away from God than just live their life totally deceived, thinking that they're right and that they're wrong. And then there's a horrible shock if they're the end. You know, it's not it's not loving for us to do that because of fear of having a different.
conversation. Yeah, it would be good if you could really turn it on mute, but over your head, so mm. you can over your head. Well, that's what happened with... Um, so, sorry, I'm not. I don't hate you. I'm just, I'm just telling you what God says, basically. It's not my opinion. I wish that everything would just start functioning as we were and everything was fine. And that there was no... I don't know, eight or seven people in the same room. And then we still keep that in. But, you know, I wish people could just be... It has to get to a point after they kind of know the gospel, understand the love of Christ, and they'll if they're chosen, they'll hunger for that, and then it will get to the point where well, look, right, this is, and just let the word speak for itself. You just say, can you read from here to here quietly, and you just say, look, that's not me speaking, that's the Lord speaking. Um, it's so weird how it became. It's the pride movement for able like brainwashing people as well. Isn't it? So people don't get indignant. Imagine, for example, right? Just give a horrible example. But someone who really desires animals I think he's or now, children, yeah. babe. Right? Sorry, so like, because if you told them that was wrong, they wouldn't get all like offended about that. Whereas if someone desires the same sex, that's like, oh, how dare you? Do you know what I mean? Like. How did that become? It's the media, isn't it? It's the media. I'm just going to message Sister Hiker and say that we finished with the reading okay. now because. Years ago, though, that was the case. I'm even imagine when you were a child, it was illegal, wasn't it? Oh. Never heard of it. The village with, with the sheep. When did it become. <laughs> <laughs> when you were anything about that. When did it become legal? Like 60s, 70s, was it? Yeah. Oh, that interests me, so. Yeah. But actually, even. Even it used to be like it was capital punishment for most of the time, it was death penalty. It was it was even during the second war in the fifties and early sixties it was a prison sentence for being caught with a gun. It only got legalised. Yeah, in this country, yeah. Yeah, like yeah. Alan Turing for a man um, for example, yeah. yeah. The second World War the code breaker guy. Yeah. He was um he was gay. And he had to hide it and he was being gay threatened because he got locked up in some parts of the country. And then he had that hand yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and that was only because he was so important for the war effort. Mm. Otherwise, he would have been thrown in a cell and not played for three weeks. So Old Testament's obviously death penalty for. Yeah, but can you read it? Being proud of the people that were being killed. Mm. It's that slow, gradual moral decline. Exactly, yeah. Because we're in the last days. Yeah, that's the last days. This slightly says so uh, offensiveness now, defensiveness. Hello. Now. I can see how that can come from in some ways, sort of. Um, oh, okay. Maybe. Hello. Apparently, um, I got a weak connection. That's what my computer says. Condemned. That's okay. We've we finished now. We only read uh, Romans chapter one, and um, we've yeah. we've finished there because we. We keep the Bible suit to two hours, so I said we said, "Oh, we'll finish, we'll end there," because everyone's having a discussion about um, homosexuality at the moment and how to kind of address that in the church. Then it probably wouldn't have been such a such a backlash. Yeah, because there was like you know fighting fire with fire, wasn't it? Yeah. I just say it sort of it sort of came to me like thinking why, you know, so such a movement of home such reality again like um such like anger against being pushed against it's like no proud to be gay and like such pride a lot because of how So pride is you're saying pride has emerged because it was fought with fire instead of with love. I think in a lot, of, like to an extent, for it being pushed so much, it's like oh, people were wrongfully, you know, killed and imprisoned things from. from men trying to judge from. them and not letting the love of God like bring them from that place, like yeah. from sin. That you know, acted acted sinfully against sin, and then you got yeah more sin. Yeah, in the end, they, so, in well, that's what it, the Bible yeah. says: sin begets sin, doesn't it? Where yeah. sin, sin will multiply, multiply sin, yeah. 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 So if you attack sin with more sin, judgment and hatred, yeah. it will just multiply it. Yeah. 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 yeah.
And I was watching this testimony about uh, this man, and he had, you know, this homosexual desire um, to be with another man. But he said that he chose God, and he said there's a difference between being gay and doing gay, mm. like and acting upon it. Same thing. Um, he says, like, as with other people who have problems with drugs and stuff like that, he said, "This is my, this is my chalice. This is my test." But I choose God over all of this, and I'll overcome to the end. Oh, it's just like a man. It's it's really nice. That God imagine a man who's married, he's got yeah, kids. Yeah, and he's married, like and he had children, yeah, and chose God's like will for his something. life, and not like say Chase after every person. person. Well, just doesn't do it. Understanding, yeah, I suppose that's what we were saying before, but understanding. Um, like sister wanted to share something today. Spirit being. Sister Heike said, oh no, froze again. I wanted to share something with you today, which I found. Let's all pray that this signal goes... Why don't we just, goes... call, just call her? Oh, yeah, just call yeah, her. Yeah, we're call her on, on FaceTime or something. Yeah. yeah. Inside your computer. Well, that's very... I'm glad we got through some. It's only very good, interesting stuff now. <laughs> yeah, because Marcus was like to me earlier, he's like, ah, oh, yeah. the end of Second Corinthians that's is a little bit boring. <laughs> so I was like, oh, well, <laughs> that's why you're reading fast. Yeah. Yeah. I said, let's get through it, it's fine. Can I have a little question then? Yeah. Mark chapter 12. Yeah, but not, um, I think she just typed it properly. Where's my Bible? It's down there. <laughs> Carry on with your question. Oh, she's... Noah's trying to call her for now. I'll just message her. Um, Noah is oh, trying yeah. to call you so we can at least hear you. What was your question, Andrew? Um, it is 12, yeah. Verse 7. Yeah. 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 We have been given grace for the love of our Lord. So why would God give God such a treasure? It tells you straight in verse 8 and 9. If you carry on. It says I'll give so great a treasure that you will be dead forever. Mm. But why would the God that believes in him save him and then tell us that we have got a God who knows what we're doing and has shed a name on far more? Because if Paul took that, then he would have had authority over the Corinthians. I think it's an exception just to keep it humble because he was an exception to Revelation that he got to see some incredible things that the apostles kept him and made him quite spiritual. Do you think that's an accurate translation then? We can look at the strong. Yeah, I'm looking at the strong. Yeah. An angel of Satan, yeah. yeah. Messenger yeah, words is his angel. I also translate it like a Cygnus. Mm-hmm. Some people think that. Let's have a look at the um let's have a look at the strongs. Let's look at the Greek. Yeah, let's have a look. So essentially like so Jesus says to his disciples in Luke that the bowl will be made of gold and even the bag will be um, it will tread upon snakes and scorpions and it will not to hurt us. Yeah. So like we can have authority over unclean spirits. Whereas here it looks like the Lord Jesus is allowing angel of Satan to talk to to men in the form to keep him humble to live right. spiritually prideful mm-hmm. so those two things seem to be opposed to each other on the surface mm-hmm. level so we're going to look at the exact translation of those two verses to see mm-hmm. if there's something more to it because 
some people. So there was given some to people me believe that it was a, a, a physical a thorn in the sickness. It's on the screen. So a thorn in the flesh. If we look at what thorn means, so thorn is scallops. Scallops. A point or, or a prickle. Yeah, I think it is. And it's only used once in the whole Bible as well, so we haven't got anything to go Could against. Could be used as a bodily annoyance or disability. What are those two um, words? G4628. Yeah, you'd have to go back as well. Skelos, which is leg. Um, sorry. Uh, sorry, I've moved that Thorn. button. What's 374? Optamapahi, optamapahi. <laughs> Here, look, show, self, see. Okay, carry on. Um, so, I've, I've already closed that, but it's still there. Um, a messenger, so messenger G3. Oh, oh, it's frozen. Oh, okay. Um, so... A messenger, G32, is an angel. angel yeah, yeah. yeah, So it is an angel from Satan. An angel of Satan yeah. is obviously Satan. Um, to, what's Buffett? Yeah, not so good. Feast. No, not, no, 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 not Buffet. Punish, to Buffet. Chastise, yeah. Look, yeah, to chastise. smack it means. Jesus to, was buffeted yeah. with hands yeah. of people is the same to word. curtail that is to chastise they were doing it to Punish. Christ when he was they were pushing him and saying who uh, prophecy who struck you bang and hit him and say who did it and he was blindfolded so I think he was pushing him around something like that yeah, yeah. Was, was doing something negative to him to keep him humble and I think it it's a form of suffering to what, keep him humble I don't know why though what I got I from know what you mean in terms of Luke yeah what I got from reading, when we read that, the the uh, the immediate thing that came to mind was the video we watched about um, the evilness that is morphine when someone's on their deathbed, because it's that pain and suffering that causes people to call out to God, because it's the only thing they can do at that moment, but actually when people mute that with morphine they don't feel that need or desire to do so and that's what brought to mind this was that Jesus said no I'm going to allow this to continue so that you know you need me so it's reminded that you actually need me does that make sense mm. Keeps Paul dependent on the Lord, keeps him lowly, keeps him weak, so that his strength, so that Christ's strength can be made perfect and full. He does. He does. He uses Satan for all his things. The the whole fulfillment of Think about Job. Remember Job? Yeah. Yeah. He allowed Satan to afflict Job so that ultimately Job could be massively blessed at the end. Um, That all these things happened to Job's blessed. And his family. Faith could be tested. Killed all his family. But in the end, his faith would persevere, and God doubled all of Joe's blessings at the end. Because what he had twice the children, twice the animals, twice the everything. Yeah, but that was um, an excessive faith, wasn't it? That Satan could be used as a weapon. Yeah. To ask for Joe, you know, took him out of it. This is an exceptional case because think, yeah. Paul actually went into heaven. Do you remember? Like in Paul went to a third heaven. So, so it's like his hedge of protection was taken away. Why does it say? Destruction of their first Corinthians, that is. Yeah. yeah, that's another way God is using Satan to punish them, really, to bring them back to God, to weaken their flesh, to humble themselves, to repent. Similarly to when Jesus says to Peter, Peter, Satan has requested to have you, to sift you like wheat, to yeah. test you. So God uses Satan to like test and refine people and chastise them and do different things with that. And I think Paul's. He obviously used Satan to enter into Judas, so Judas would betray Christ and get killed. It's all just for God's plan, and God Satan thinks that ah, God's going to go, ah, 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 you're actually working for my plan. And we have to remember, <laughs> Paul's biggest weakness probably would be pride, 
because Paul was the, the he was the best student yes. in the Pharisee school. Mm-hmm. He was like praised by all the Pharisees. He was like, you know, a really good student. He was going to be a mighty man of God. So mm-hmm. pride would be a massive stumbling block for Paul. So perhaps the Lord knew that. Um, so he knew, but he knew this would keep him remembering that actually, you know, you are a servant because look, I, I allow Satan to do this to you. Yes, you've got power and authority in my name, but I am the overall authority, actually. Does that make sense? It probably tormented him as well for his past crimes. Probably had an unclean spirit. Paul is, Paul is an exception. He's an exceptional case. I wouldn't take a doctor from this, yeah. But conversely, you can have a doctor in heaven if we're doing really unrepentant, bottom of sin in God's word and allow Satan to come against us for our construction of our best stuff. Repent. Mm. Sister Hyper wanted to share something. She's yeah, there. sorry, sister. Hello. Hello, we can hear you. Well, we want to listen. Did you have something to share? Oh, okay. Oh yeah, no, that's very true indeed, yeah. Satan's best trick is to hide so well that he makes us believe he does not exist. Absolutely. No, that's very true. Um, He's almost getting more, as the days come on, um, he's getting more bold in the media. People are starting to openly worship him now. Um... In the, in the music industry, in the film and TV industry. A lot of celebrities, in the past, you know, through the last few decades, he's been kind of in the background and people have made oblique references to satanic things. But if you look at the media today, I could send some stuff in the group. Um, but people are now just openly worshipping Satan. There's um, a call for Satanism to be taught in schools. They're literally putting up statues of Baphomet, which is, you know, the horned goat. Um, Satan God with children like on each shoulder and there's some really um... well, the satanic church is going into schools at the moment um, evangelising evangelising <laughs> love apparently and that they're all about love they're about true love um, which is tolerance that's quite a big thing at the moment and there are schools that are opening up like satanic clubs after school and that this whole kind of thing you know where they're like oh we have to be loving of all things and we have to be accepting of homosexuality and all this that's now going past that point now to we have to be loving and acceptance of Satan. Oh, poor yeah. Satan. Like, you know, everyone always gives this guy a hard time. He's not that bad, actually. We sure like him. And it comes across in cartoons on the telly, actually. Yeah. Like, there's stuff that, you know, I have to vet kind of what I let Isla watch. Cause he's a hero a sometimes, like Hellboy. Love Monster. And it's a little date. It's like Satan. He's a red monster with horns. And he's like the one giving love to everybody and that he should actually be loved and all this kind of stuff. Like, mm. that's what it's turning into nowadays. Yes, it's real brainwashing. It's real brainwashing, yeah. Well, it's preparing everyone to accept the Antichrist, that's what it's doing. Yeah. Which will be Satan. Surely, uh, I don't know if you can say it, I mean, this is all happening to me, but an eternity with no heaven is only spiral, though. Well, they're blurring out these obvious lines that there are now, aren't there? There's, there is an obvious line between right and wrong. But what the world's trying to do is rub that out. Yeah, attacking the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's why Jesus says, Woe to those who make these little ones to sin. Yeah. It's better for them to have not been born, he says, the ones that lead little children yeah. astray at a young age. Just have to accept this now. This is like normal life. You come across this when when 
and you go out. So to might as well uh, see it in school. Now. But that was on Friday when I was there, so I never. Uh, I was told by my colleagues uh, on the mm. Monday. Yeah. Mm. Amazing. Yeah, they just need to leave the children alone. Leave them alone. Stop like trying to teach them about sex and trans sex and cross dressing. Just leave them to be children. They don't need to think about these things until they're adults. Yeah. This is adult stuff. Just leave them, leave them be, man. Let them be children. Yeah, yeah. I remember randomly some friends going to like a went to some bar and there happened to be like some sort of cross dressing night or something and it was really interesting because my friend Ollie was I, I want to speak to you like felt really unnerved and like disgusted by it it was like this is this is like wrong and couldn't like look at people I was like, oh you know it's just people wearing dresses like that. you're right Ollie. And going out there, but there's obviously like his spirit just being like yeah. really unnerved by it. Yeah, I just thought it was funny. Going to the spirit and the next day, and obviously the person that for him to like just naturally feel that that's sort of wrong. But yeah, it is completely it's, naturally wrong. The verse that came to mind, says Hiker, from what you wrote as well, was. um from, funnily enough, Second Corinthians chapter 2, when it says that least Satan should take advantage of us because we are not ignorant of his devices. So he has he has schemes. Um, another word for devices is schemes. But we're not to be ignorant of them. He's always got schemes and plans and he's subtly trying to do things behind the scenes and influence people. But yeah, we're not ignorant of his of his plans and his schemes. The Bible says that he. Um, I'll, I'll post on the on the group actually tomorrow. I'll I'll put a little mini study about Satan and his plans and the way he works and what the Bible reveals about him. But essentially, that he is a liar, a deceiver. He schemes and and tries to deceive people in the background, and he he roams around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Um, but we are to resist him, and when we do resist him, he will flee from us. He's always looking for a, a mark. There's no truth in him. Like, when you follow someone, there's no truth in them. Yeah, that's why they attack today is on the truth. They'd say, yeah. tell people there's no such thing as objective truth, you know. Mm. There is scripture that I'm trying to find. Which ultimately is really just purely an attack on the Word of God because nothing else it claims to be objective truth. Mm. The only objective truth that exists is the word of the Creator who made everything, made truth, because what he says goes. The word of God is the only thing that claims to be the objective truth of all morality. There's, um, Matthew 24, 10 to 13. Uh, Mark, it's not that one, but there's a scripture, and I think they're 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 together. I can't find it. Um, that says, "In the last days, they'll say, wrong is right and right is wrong." And in the last days, many will become offended, and that's exactly what's happening. Everyone they're literally offended, saying, right? like, you know, heterosexuality is, is wrong, and homosexuality is right actually, and oh, men kind of being the provider that's wrong, and feminism is right. And if you disagree with that, they're all offended. And it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm it's sure. It, yeah, and um, it's so true. It's so true. Yeah. Seeing it playing out. Yeah, yeah, seeing it playing out. Faster and faster. And everyone's. It wasn't even like this when I was a kid, only 20 years ago. I said to Marcus, it's like walking on eggshells whenever you have a conversation with anybody. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really, really hard. Really hard. Yeah, and even like. Respect in the world, like, you know, it's like, well, you know, it's too much. It's too it's much now, yeah. yeah, yeah. He's gone mad, that's what they say, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like, you know, it's like, you can have no more compass, and you're just used to that fleshly feelings of the compass, which is just, yeah, exactly. If it offends them, it's wrong. And you just yeah. navigate life by just how they feel, and it's yeah. just the flesh gone mad. Yeah, yeah. 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 
but the Bible says that our heart is deceitful. We can't trust our feelings. Exactly. And, you know, we're, we're beyond feelings. This is what I explained to my sister when I went to Greece. It says the heart is deceitful above, the, above all things. The big, Who can know it? The Desperately big, wicked. The big thing well, that um, my heart. sister realised when I was with her was that yeah. in Christ, we actually, I know, I said to her, everything you experience as Caroline, all the hurt and annoyance that you get, actually, when you get baptised, that's going to die. And yeah, you'll get pangs of it after, but you actually ignore that because you're now in the spirit. It's so temporary, isn't it? Because you, people focus on these feelings that are going to come and go in an instant and never come back, but they focus on them. Like, yeah, oh. but your eternal salvation and life will not just go in an instant. That no. is like forever. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I'm so glad to be reminded of this. Like, the that's why I love it was so guys. funny it's Jack's high pictures tree. that he sent <laughs> about when he leaves <laughs> yeah it's very funny <laughs> I, I was laughing so much because so like, I can imagine Jack saying it more deceitful than yeah. things and it's Jack desperately wicked exactly who can understand like, it like, I the Lord search the heart I test like the mind even to right. give every man according yeah. to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds it's our own internal emotions and flesh and everything deceives us and tricks us so the heart is part of the flesh yeah the heart we get though god gives us a new heart and a new spirit when we are filled with the holy spirit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, might, you get a new entirely new heart new set of oh, yeah. desires and, yeah you have god's law written on your heart see that see that my ex 